Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yeah. Your iPhone, your watch, it's correct. It's that time. It's time for another, hopefully, always exciting episode of The Rich Redmond Show where we talk about things like music, motivation, success. It's our goal to make you laugh, love, learn. Hopefully, it's highly educational. Hopefully, it's delivered in a very entertaining fashion. Jim, we call it edutainment. Everyone say hi to Jim. Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Hey, guys. Co-producer, co-host. This guy co's everything. He's got to actually... It's your show. It is your, it is your show. Co. It's his. It's your show. Co. It's his That's podcast it network. That. That's right. And Jim, you've been doing some all sorts of producing. You have like 20, 25 podcasts. I don't know how you do it. Well, you know, you just do it. Yeah. Make and sure then, it and you're and you got a new look today. The Sean Pelton hat, the newsy hat. Get yeah. your papers right here. My 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 wife wanted to make fun of me for it, but uh, then she saw it on me. She goes, "It actually kind of looks good." Did you pick it up in a store? Is like an Amazon? No, it's, like a, it's a bona fide Boston Scally. It's a Boston Boston Scally dot uh, com, I believe. Pack the car. So listen, man. You know, um, you know what I found out about it. What? Our old friend Hal Bowman. Yeah, I gotta gotta catch up with Hal. Have you guys yeah. been in touch? I, I every now and then I'll probably hit him up once or twice a year and say hello. Well, he's keeping that's a friend of ours who's keeping the world safe for children, education, yeah, and children. That's right. We're all teachers at heart. Look, teaching at, like a Jim, rock star. We're going to get into this today, and I'm so happy that this young man uh, made time for us because driving to Spring Hill at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday is a major commitment. He's like, yeah, no problem, because I have a huge list of drummers that I call personal friends that I want to get on this show, but they have to be available when we're available. So we just lucked out today. Uh, today's guest, a Florida native, calling Nashville home since 2000, and he's been the drummer with the award-winning country pop recording artist Lauren Elena for nine years. I'm talking about our friend McCoy Gibbs. What's up? buddy man i'm just happy to be here dude yeah. looking tall thin handsome there's like <laughs> you're like a human um he's the opposite of me you're a human hang clothing hanger you know what i mean <laughs> clothes <laughs> just hang on you perfectly you tower above the drums people are never going to miss you i'm sinking i think like this behind the drums <laughs> Well, here's the thing about whenever you and i stand next to each other yeah it's kind of like uh the dukes of hazard the uh the General Lee car, it's yeah. zero and one. I'm the zero, you're the one. I was standing next to McCoy and I felt like point one. You know? So, but you know, you hear that all, it, it, it's, it's got to get old, but there's not a lot of tall drummers. You've got like Chad Smith, you've got maybe, um, who are some other guys that we could think of? Chad Smith comes to mind. Ronnie Venucci, I think with the Killers is kind of tall. Okay. Um, here in town, uh, my God, it's a short list, Jim. Who's tall? We're all no like, pun intended. We're all ground huggers. I mean, yeah. like, look at Simon Phillips. You know, well, it's also hard to tell how tall they are because we always see them sitting down. Yeah, right. so, and I, I actually like to put the camera up three feet on the wall. So <laughs> I'm a low rider, like so. So, but you sit even. You sit t pretty high. I do. I think it offsets. There's angles there with when you, to be comfortable. Yeah. Also, I have like never taken a lesson, so no one ever said you want this yeah. angle at this. Point or like in playing match grip, you know, sting. So if I'm coming down on the drum to hit it where I want to hit it, it has to kind of sit lower because my arms are longer, yeah. but I'm also sitting higher. So it's like it when I first started, I mean, the snare was probably below my knees or at thigh level. Yeah. And then it's I cool. gradually started to realize that, okay, if I like it's, it's as you know, it changes as, yeah. as, you, as you age. Bring that mic a little bit closer. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There okay. we go. There now, we go. what about the Opry? You guys over sit in at the Opry? The Opry, the first. Dozen times I play the Opry, I dropped a stick in oh, wow. three songs. I drop because I, it's the the angles and everything are very interesting. Two rides, two rides. It's a little ergonomically, it's different. We'll yes. say, yeah. but I mean, you're not going to argue with with yeah with that because it, and it it's just um, first of all, it's nerve wracking when you first play. Yeah, but it's very um, unorthodox setup and the the different the the space between where the tom is and the snare coming up. Like yes. I, I mean, that's where it was. I would. He used to like and it just hit that hit that rim of that thing. Whoop, there it goes. Well, thank thank God there's a there's a you know a hydraulic throne. That's a, a great that, investment on their part. Mm -hmm. but speaking of being tall, those early hydraulic thrones, I think they make one now. Never went tall enough for me. They only got certain heights, so I had to like on my rider, it's or backline rider, it's no no hydraulic thrones, only spindle thrones. Now I believe. Uh, DW Gibraltar. I think they make a higher one now, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you were saying that this unbelievably is your first drum podcast appearance. 
Yeah, it is. I I, uh, I feel like as a drummer in this town, I have a little bit of imposter syndrome because uh, I didn't start as a drummer. I didn't. I wasn't like. Um, you know, from the age of five, got behind the kit and like, that was my thing. And but like, you're a musician's musician. Like you played sax, you played, mm -hmm. you sing. Yeah. Very mu musical family, right? Yeah. My dad uh, was in a little folk trio in the seventies called the rainbow. Shout out to the rainbow. And this, it's spelled <laughs> B E A U X. It's French for boy. It's so French. They were yeah. so cultured. Um, <laughs> but it was the seventies there. My mom and dad are hippies and like, you know, they, yeah. they, Similar to the Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary, that type of vocal, they, vocally um, is where they excelled. And they still sing to, to this day together. Um, they actually came to Nashville somewhere in the late 70s, mid 70s, I think. Um, and through their uh, their demo tape or eight track, whatever it was back then, on Music Row. And wow. I got, they got a lot of no's because the songs, they knew their songs weren't great. But several studios offered them gigs as studio singers. Wow. Because back then, a trio of dudes that could sing so tight harmony wise were like a synthesizer. They, they, you know, the Elvis and the, the or, Jordan Ayers. Thank you, Jordan Ayers. Yeah. Um, that was such a sound back then. And they got offered gigs and they were like, well, you know, I don't know, like we want to be the band. And like two of them had just gone to seminary and had some kids. And like they were all kind of, it was, it was that watermark moment, or if you will, where they're like, this is where we kind of decide if, yeah. we, if this is a full time thing. And uh, they all decided to kind of say, you know what, we love doing this, but we're going to we're going to change direction. And they decided to kind of all do separate things. Yeah. So two of them became ministers and one became a politician. Why? <laughs> Cause I gotta say your parents are, your parents are, are they still kind of like hippie ish? And, and how are they like living in Florida? <laughs> so yeah, what's funny is like, uh, you know, they've always been in Florida. My dad did become an ordained pastor and yeah. now he at the Methodist church and he's retired now, but he was there for, I think almost 50 years of service to the ministry. Wow. Um, wow. And my mom was a teacher. They actually met in Atlanta at a, at they were, my dad's band was playing. And she was a cocktail waitress. And so, yeah. Right? Classic. There it is. And um, at the, I don't think that bar's there anymore. But it was, even though they were, you know, uh, in the hippie area, they, you know, uh, they're definitely like, uh, as a minister, still work too, like, wild and crazy and all that stuff. So uh, when they decided to, I guess, settle down and change this new path, and my sister and I came along, and then here we are. And, and yeah. but he, he's all, music has always been in our family. He always sang. Um my sister is a doctor of music. She's the choral director at Florida Southern College. So wow. She's, and she's probably, and since she's done so many clinics and she's gone, she sang operas in Italy and she's traveled the world and singing and conducting. And, and she's the overachiever, I like to say. Yeah. She went the education route. And I went the, oh, I'm just going to like yeah. hang up and play in bars and like make some but I mean, you But you went to Belmont. What year was that? 2000 to 2004. 2000 to 2004. So we're a generation apart. So if I'm generation X, as am I. I'm a, I'm a, technically a millennial. Technically. Oh. I'm an elder millennial. Yes. So you were born in the late 80s then? 80, 81 is the oh. first year. Yeah, According yeah. to many Google searches, 81 is the, the uh, that's my birth year, is the first millennial year. Okay. And then to like 90. I think that's a really early millennial year because I've heard like 83, 84. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I've heard anywhere from 81, 83 to like 92, 94, 96 in there. Yeah. Right. But I'm an elder millennial. So it was that, that weird like kind of mid ground of like, we didn't have, obviously didn't have computers when I was born. Um, at least we didn't have uh, uh, home computers that is. Yeah. Cell phone, when the first cell phone my mom got was the big, the big one that unfolded and like had the antenna and the, the whole, brick about yeah. the size, yeah, size of this. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, it was just a, a weird uh, era of, there was no YouTube to look at, to look up, oh, I wanna learn how to play this and whatever. So, so we, we slowed down records. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Or yeah. I remember, um, recording songs off the radio, mm -hmm. like hitting play and record at the same oh, time yeah. on the tape. And then, then when we thought it was cool to like, we had when CDs and burning CDs became a thing, I could burn CDs to a tape or like advice, like take a CD and like come, it was just all those things of, of getting music how you wanted it. And, yeah. um, and, and it was harder to figure things out, right. which we made us more invested mm -hmm. and then increased our passion. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the video aspect really helps. Cause I remember getting, um, I think it was like the video version of Rush Chronicles. Okay. And they had a compilation of all Rush uh, videos on there. One of them was Subdivisions. And when he does the crossovers, the triplets on it, did that part, mm -hmm. I never realized what he was doing. Actually, I kind of, I did know what he was doing. It was the the uh, offbeat bell of the ride symbol and the left hand on the, yeah. you know, that, that part where he's yeah. doing it. Seeing it, you have no, like, no idea what yeah. he's doing. 
Until I saw, I'm like, that's what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. The first time Carter Beaufort released the Under the Table and Drumming. Yeah. Yeah. Because Dave Matthews was the first band that, like, I was like, whoa, this is. And that was in an era, my senior year of high school, we did a thing called Grad Night. And it's where, being in Florida, every all the high schools send their senior class to Disney. It's like... So this is like 95, 96, right? Uh, yeah. 2000s when I graduated high school. Gotcha, gotcha. And so they send them all to Disney, like a lock-in around Disney, right? And they have music played. The headliners that year were Destiny's Child and Jessica Simpson. Yeah. The only um, band band that was there was a band called B.B. Mac. Yeah. Back here, baby. Yeah. That song? That was, they're one and done, right? They played on a side stage no bigger than this room. They played two sets. I watched both sets, was just enamored with it. Like, that was the year of pop and just female pop. And, like, there was no, like, real bands. And then Dave Matthews' band came along. Yeah. It was just different. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go down this route. Really sophisticated jam band. Yes. Right. And I didn't yeah. really know. Like, but they, they did a good job of their records were so well put together. But then see them live, you're like, oh, my gosh, they've. They're, they stretch. They, yeah. And and of course, Carter is a unique beast. Just you know? a monster. Right. Yeah. So seeing, I've never tried to emulate his drumming. I've just been inspired by how he, some of his over the bar line fills and how he it, it, uh, interprets rhythms and polyrhythms and stuff. Yeah. But the video aspect of that was the first time I thought, oh, he's playing a double paradiddle on that on that part of this song. I'm like, oh, okay, that I can see it now. And it's, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it was the Huertas on the crash symbol Tom and the, yeah. the on Ants Marching. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Just, That's good. Un- and yeah. scan, scan, scan. That was the first song that that I became aware of. That was that's, you know, that was his band. first big hit. Yeah. So you were graduating yeah. high school, and mm-hmm. I was getting my master's degree <laughs> at the University of North Texas, and and that was a great uh, breeding ground because we would all be listening to like everything from pop radio to fusion to going back and listening to bebop and big band and stuff, and it was crazy. So so that's our generation apart, but obviously the music is in your blood. You know, you're starting your seventh grade saxophone, then you're learning guitar, singing at 14, sang in church, vocal ensembles, even played in the drum line your junior and senior year, but no formal lessons because we've been on tour together two times. I forget the years. Yes. 2018, I believe. And this year year. we did some, you did some dates on the Highway Desperado tour Mm -hmm. and I'm side stage watching you. You know, I always, for all the drummers, I try to take photos. I try to load everybody up with a little some videos like, Hey, you just know, awesome. By the way, load it up, you know, stick it on your Instagram. Cause it's really hard to get high production value. Even if we set up our GoPro, when you have some movement, mm-hmm. it looks nice. It looks totally pro. So yeah. I try to do that for the drummers on the tour. And we actually snapped the photo, the drummers of the highway Desperado tour. And is it just me? Or is like, I said, the drummers were, um, 54, 42, 25 and 23. I was like, <laughs> There's some young kids Passing here. the torch, if you will. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. But it, yeah. I don't want to pass it yet, though. I'm, st- I, you know what I mean. I don't want it. It's true. I want to keep that fire lit for another 15 years if I can. Mm-hmm. Amen. Um, but anyways, when I watch you play, you have such a nice touch and such a nice feel on the instrument. It's very natural. It's really hard to believe. But you know what? Maybe those lessons would have ruined it. Mm. And, and that's an that's an interesting take for like. Because I always thought that, like, kind of touching on earlier, the imposter syndrome of, you know, I started on saxophone, learned how to read music, really enjoyed the mel- melody. Could he- I use my ear more than anything. Yeah. Um, because well, you sing great harmonies, right? Well, I just, yeah. from from a, I was born with a, an ability to hear pitch. Like, yeah. I didn't, it's not like something I worked every day, like, no, 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 no. No, it's like, it just, <laughs> it was like, I hear a song on the radio yeah. and I could hear it. And my dad obviously sang a lot of harmonies and my sister sings really well. So in the cars on road trips, we'd sing. So that, nice. that just an innate ability to to listen for other things things other than the melody or things around the melody and like yeah um has had come out a lot in playing saxophone and like improvising that i played in the jazz bands played alto tenor barry all of them um like lisa simpson right there you go yeah (laughs) my sister got an acoustic guitar for christmas one year and i got insanely jealous and because it was the coolest instrument like who doesn't want to play guitar right sure at the campfire yeah like in the barbie movie i'm gonna (laughs) sing at you right now at you and Did so, you see the Barbie movie? No. You oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, I thought you, I was thinking. Josh. Well, Ryan Gosling yeah. is. Oh my gosh, um, it's yeah. so good, yeah. crazy. But um, so I just I would shedded the guitar. Like I took my dad's guitar, which was steel string. My sister got a nylon my, his steel string Washburn guitar. Would sneak in his office, grab it, and get. He had this little camp songbook of like everything from like Kumbaya to like uh, old Beatles songs or like folk songs, things like that. And I would just learn how to play these songs. And most of the songs you would hear in church or at, at like church camps and stuff. And then. The internet came around and tablature came around. You could say, I want to learn how to play, 
you know, Crash by Dave Matthews. How, and mm-hmm. it says you where to put your fingers. And I just woodshedded that stuff. And then you take your guitar to like a little party and all of a sudden there's girls sitting around the You're like, like, ooh. Wait, I'm going to sing at you. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah, you know. that, it worked for Billy Joel. Uh, yeah, yeah, I bet. Because yeah. he told that story. I saw him at UConn. Uh, it was like a, an evening with Billy Joel, but it was all like songwriter stories type thing. Uh-huh. And he was talking about his high school um, development and getting into his early teenage years. And he always could play classical piano and stuff like that. And he said, I would get invited to these houses looking the way I look, you know, not being the most popular kid in school. And uh, inevitably in some of these houses where I grew up around, would, there would be a piano. So I just kind of go there by myself and get into my thing. And I'd look up and there'd be a girl watching. Mm-hmm. And I would get into it even more and more dramatically. And I look up, there would be three girls watching. <laughs> He's like, and then before you know it, Christy Brinkley's my wife. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. The Uptown girl herself. I yeah. Mean, you, I would say that, again, I don't want to generalize, but that is a motive. I guess attention in general is a motivator. Like, oh, wait, I'm doing something that is garnering attention. Female attention was good for, for me. Like, it was an, obviously a little motivator when you're in high school, middle school, whatever. But I also just wanted to be better and be good at it. And like, and like, yeah. and, and I started a band and, um, you know, in high school, like it's a crap shoot. Like who's going to be able to play drums and who's going to be able to play bass. And we played lock-ins and then like we rehearsed at the, my dad being the minister, we rehearsed in the youth room at the church and we used their, their kind of janky PA system. And then it was just a lot of fun. We saved up money and bought a little power mixer. And like, we we went on tour we, with my mom's minivan and yeah. I'll just, just like, you look back on those times and you understand that that's really where, like you really cut your teeth a little bit, but you also like, it's where you learn that pa- you have to have the passion for well, it. It's like, you know, Dave Grohl, what does he say? He says, you know, get in the garage and, and fail. Be in a band. Be mess up. Go out and play gigs mm-hmm. and fall on your face. And just think be, about, yeah, be a band. Think about any of those bands, like from Foo Fighters to U2, like how, how did four dudes from Ireland or four guys were like, like just that just became like, th- what are the chances of all those four guys in the same city or the same town or meeting at the, the the stars aligning, and then all of a sudden that is it because that's been the original membership member line for, for that forever. It's yeah. the same kind of insane odds of one little hopeful sperm cell breaking through <laughs> yes. whatever it needs to break through. It's that kind of like the odds are so stacked yes. against, yeah, three dudes from Seattle killing heavy metal just i mean just like i i had to forget who the interview was uh it was some at record executive or might have been one of the artists in one of those hair bands that said they were just uh on top of the world white snake or one of those like the, at sony or whatever label they were at boom that, that was there when you walk in the lobby of sony in la it was boom it was white snake above the door david like, coverdale all yeah. blah, blah, blah he said literally one like it, whatever it when there's a janitor taking the photos down. And when Nevermind pictures- came out or whatever it was, he walked in like two weeks later and it was, it, everything had changed. It was Nirvana. It was grunge. It was yep. like you go to JCPenney catalogs. It was flannels. It was all part of the reason that Kurt- It was overnight. Oh, I mean, it, and it just, boom. Doc Allison Martin Ch- sales through the roof. Allison mm-hmm. Chains was up there, not 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 poison. You know, it was just, it, it just changed everything. But Dave Grohl was, you look at those videos, the shirtless dude, he had totally had a concept of how to play the drums in a rock and roll band like he has a, he had like a, a a doctorate in playing rock and roll drums and when you when you s- solo his drum tracks so focused and Dude, just mature the velocity behind like there's there's a video that circulates you know it's the good and the bad of the internet but the good is this video like he's just playing and he's he's playing this and he, and his his six tuplets around the kit and all that stuff every note like if you were to actually like look at the track i bet the the waveforms are so, like because he's just so evenly spaced yes yeah and like the velocities are perfect it, it, they're it's just it's fantastic and to this day he says i he says i don't practice but he's the kind of guy like you know he'll he'll show up at, at, at dw or some event or something and he's got to jump up on the drums perfect example him playing um that tune with Tom Petty on Saturday Night Live, just owning it. Oh my God. I did not know the story behind that until, it, again, it was on one of those like interviews. Um, and he, they, like, Tom asked him to do that, like, kind of last minute. Yeah. And he, th- he saw him play and was like, dude, you know, come on, play Jones, you know, like, and he said, yeah, and, and just slayed it. Yeah. I mean, because that's, he knew, Tom knew, like, he knows this feel, he's going to slay this. So. And then that same tenacity and passion and focus and natural God given ability takes over to the guitar and then his singing style is like 
Not only did he change rock and roll once, he changed it twice at the highest level, and they're the last rock band on the world. There's a there's a exhibit in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame about that. It's a very small one, at least last time I was there, that talks about his transition from Nirvana, the Kurt Cobain tragedy, and how he had to rebuild the, the pieces and like and then say, all right, I'm going to just, you know, uh, I've, I've heard that, uh, what's the, is someone getting the best? Best of you is yeah. about that situation and kind of about almost his anger towards like, why did you have to, man, like, why did you have to die? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we all go through grief in different ways and obviously you have to express that. So, um, but we're, I mean, just thankful for him and, and like all those, the, the influences he gave us and like, and, and he's still being a stand up dude and still touring and like went to the broken leg when he was on, like that, I saw that tour when it came to Nashville yeah. on the throne of guitars and everything. Just, he's, he's just, a, I think he's kind of like a beacon of light in this world because, you know, he still like hangs out with his mom. He loves his mom. And, and then, you know, he, he did a week hosting, filling in for Chelsea Handler on her show. Oh, that's when right. she, Jim, did you ever see that? There's I've heard of it. Dave Grohl yeah. wearing a, a, a pearl snap, a, you know, Western shirt, five nights in a row, hosting a comedic television show and had never done it before in his life and crushed it. Yeah. He's just a personal dude. Like, and, um, you know, he's one of those kind of uh, ambassadors of rock right now that we have. And I'm glad that they're still going. But. Yeah, me too, man. So the music's in you. You end up at Belmont. You get your music business major. Who are your teachers at Belmont at the time? So I did, I did one music class. It was a basic music theory class. Everything else was business. Um, copyright law, publishing, wow. um, management. So you got your textbooks? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, I have my audio textbooks. I don't, oh. I don't have, there's a copyright law book, copyright law book that I still have. Um, but I had two audio engineering classes and then oh. like a music appreciate, or it was like a music production class where like um, you had to do projects like, all right, everybody take a song from the 60s uh, and I want you to tell me what instruments are on this track what, you know, blah, 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 who's singing, give, give us like all the liner notes and tell us what you hear. And he said, this is going to be great for your ear, but it's also going to ruin music for you forever. Because now if you do this for just a semester, now you hear a song on the radio, you're gonna be like, oh, I hear a guitar, I hear a mandolin, I hear steel, yep. I, whatever. Um, but it was also good to, to all these things. It's so funny, as you say, all these things that start to happen for a reason and, and the skill set that you start to build. Because at the time I was not playing drums. Yeah. I went to college, not a drummer. I, I just love the fact that you've been playing drums for a relatively short period of time and you're doing it at the highest level and on, on major tours. I was a, your typical late bloomer. Like yeah. I just didn't, I got to, so after the band in high school and I was like, man, we got a thing, got some connections here. I'm going to come to Nashville, blah, blah, blah. I get there freshman year. I'm just like, holy poop. Like yeah. everyone is so good. They can sing really well. They play guitar way better than I do. What is my niche? It's not saxophone, even though that's cool. Yeah. Like, what Jim, is my Jim and I both wanted to play saxophone. Yeah. Well, I started out playing saxophone. Yeah. Dude, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, st I still I grabbed the horn out of the attic the other day. And, like, I was cleaning stuff out, and I was like, I mean, my embouchure is torn up. I can't hold a note for more than three seconds because it's just it's hurts. But yeah. I was like, oh wait, that's actually kind of still fun, you know? Yeah. But, Heck yeah. But uh, so it was one of those things where like I needed to find my niche, and at Belmont, you know, you're just kind of figuring it out. Belmont was the perfect place for me to figure it out. Um, and I wasn't competing against these musician, actual like drummers. And like, I wasn't doing commercial drums. I was doing kind of figuring out my own thing, but getting a business degree. Yeah. Smart. So I started like, I still had the drumline background. I played drumline in high school for a couple last, last couple of years, just because I got bored with saxophones. I'm gonna do something cool. Like drummers are cool. Let's try that. You know? But, but what, how did you handle the pressure of, of getting that super insanely clean double stroke roll together? Because on a snare line, you got to match with the 10 other guys. And I, so I played tenors first. Okay. And those, that was actually a little more forgiving. Those, those are like the pinstripe heads as opposed to those Kevlar heads that are just like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the, I had a nice, it was and the, you play with mallet. So it was like a little bit, I kind of, and that actually helped melody wise. Cause I could kind of hear, do, 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 do. you know, I could hear as a far and read the notes a little bit, but I also hear that interpret that uh, as with my ear. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the tenors and like, you know, got pretty good at it enough to like, play and be drum captain there in high school and then audition for the Vandy drum line because Belmont didn't have a football team. That's smart. And got into the Vandy line. And that, that was big college football. Vandy was awful, but they were still like SEC football, man. Like, and so I got big school with a small school. I was went to a small school, but I got big school experience yeah. with big football games. The perk of being in the marching band is you got to play in the basketball band. And yeah. the basketball band was drum set and like, you know, the <laughs> inside, yo know, man, just playing we will, you know, we will yeah, just way up here. Oh man. Doosh, doosh, blap. And it was so much fun. I, I remember seeing videos of me, random videos of me playing back then and how bad my tempo was and feel was, but my hands were so clean because yeah. I've been playing marching band for 
like everything was gah, 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 you know but then like like you're rushing through a fill to like get because you know it's exciting whatever but that's how i kind of started to say wait i might like have something here how did you tame your tempo if it was like because because i think that i had tons of technique as a young man but probably not you know, I wasn't necessarily focusing on that until I started doing gigs and people started yelling at me. Uh -huh. Hey, kid, you're rushing, you're dragging, or you're too loud. Or like, we grow so much from being yelled at, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And and so if we if we can embrace that, we can grow. And then also the, you know, um, the expectation of playing with clicks, which has probably had started to rear its ugly head very much so when you were started to play the drums. I, fortunately, I... I, every time I was in an ensemble atmosphere as a drummer, it was with people that um, were f either friends or it was a like marching band where it wasn't super high intensity, yeah. like get this right or you're out. Yeah. Because I would have probably quit if it was that. I, I definitely respond more to like, hey, no, it's fine. You know, Positive not motivation. quite there, but like, yeah. you know, like it'll be, if you don't get the gig, that's your, that's your feedback. Yeah. So what I started doing is before any of that, came about or any risk of that it was i would go belmont had these music um re rehearsal rooms in their school music in the basement just individual rooms pianos in some of them and like where you sit down and you just practice because guys had to practice and girls had to practice a lot so like they had yeah. you could sign up sign in and like you go to your practice time i figured out that at the end of the day from like uh, they closed at midnight but usually from like 10 to, to midnight they, the drum room was always vacant i would just like walk down there and look in nobody's there and i'm not a school music students so i kind of felt bad. i didn't want to go i wouldn't want to take away from anyone's time yeah so i would just sneak down there if you will and like it was right across the courtyard from my dorm yeah. and i would just put the headphones on i had a cd player there and the first two records i learned to play to were vertical horizon everything you want nice um and tonics lemon parade oh and it was just that's a debut record from tonic love it yeah just very simple pop rock acoustic rock drums and um i actually had a lesson a little bit quote unquote lesson. It was really more of a like, hey, I want to meet this dude, Ed Toth. I think it's Toth. It could be Toth. Yeah, it's Ed Toth. Yeah. It's Ed Toth. Yeah. Another Canadian who plays with the Doobie Brothers who yeah. was in Vertical Horizon. He was the drummer on that record. And, yeah. and I, so I just dove into Vertical Horizon, got the Running on Ice live record and got their early stuff that was just them and acoustics and a drum machine and like Matt Scannell and Keith Kane, I think are the two guys that started it. And I think Matt, Matt might live here. Matt, he might. Yeah. Um, uh, another uh, another ironic kind of I, I think I made it moment was Vertical Horizon open for us at a open for Lauren at a festival recently like couple last couple of years so it was kind of funny but full circle yeah um, anyway that's how I learned to play to tempo yes because records most of those records were on a click and I just and it also taught me like you know because I didn't grow up influenced by like the Neil Perts of the world and those guys that would just and the like I was because I didn't start playing drums till like I was in my twenties yeah so like. I didn't have that. Oh, I got to learn all these notes. It was more like, I want to play to this record and make it feel good. Right. And that's kind of where I started. And it developed just a very a meat and potatoes, if you will, but also listening and hearing as, as an instrumentalist as well, complimenting the melody and like playing in and out of the click and like being able to like, you know, on top and, and behind and things and learning yeah. all that, just playing to records. And that's now you're what, also a singing drummer, which is like, yeah. you're a Phil Collins or a Stan Lynch and Stuart Copeland did some background vocals and all that kind of stuff. And that's like your, your it's a third fifth, limb, it's fifth a, limb. It's yeah. like a fifth limb. So, so Jim, you know, McCoy is like playing with Ableton tracks. He's got four body limbs going, and he's singing. <laughs> yeah. So well, it makes it makes sense. Have you tried singing and drumming before, though, Rich? Um. Yeah, but I'm such a bad singer. That's not a gift, right? <laughs> but you know, um, as far as a background, but you know, it's almost like you want to like you want to do something with your kick drum that is it's it's completely different from the rhythm of the vocal mm -hmm. yeah and then you're throwing in pitch that you have to nail Dude, what about and, like dean castronovo well, well he's my just a singer God, singer he's, my goodness yeah i mean you, you got don henley phil collins like yeah. the, the main guys that are like but you you think about don henley and his drumming and i, I think he's a great drummer and fantastic obviously he's not gonna He's not playing the hardest song. He's not going to win the drum offs, right? right. But, yeah. but that but, voice, oh my God. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And just his ability to play, because he's the one that wrote the melodies, and, or one of the ones that wrote those melodies, he's interpreting what he wants, and it's perfect for the song. Yes. Um, and just how those things were recorded. And then, of course, Phil, I've got some of Phil Collins' big band stuff, and it was like his swing, and like yeah. like that was really fun to listen to. And his son is kicking it, too. Nick Nick Collins. Oh, yeah. He's like in a fusion band with... Uh, um, Lukather's son, you know, it's oh, like geez. all the sons of like superstars yeah. and they have like a fusion band. 
And uh, he did a clinic at P- PASIC last year, and we got to, I got to see his clinic, and then we got yeah. to smoke cigars afterwards, and he's just like, it's in his blood, man. Yeah. You know? And uh, the, sing- the singing thing is just because it comes so natural. There are definitely the one, I will say, the one, one of those moments where I remember getting some criticism, it was really just, it was constructive. Um, I was doing a sound check, I think, with my, one of my former bands, Hot Shell Ray, yep. and um, at the Rutledge when it was a music venue. And one of the more um, I don't, abrasive sound persons, people there, he, uh, he was, but I, I, I say abrasive, I also, I also mean he's very, like, he tells it like it is. We'll say transparent, because at the end of the day, he was right. I was playing, and then I started singing, and he was like, hit the dadgum thing. It's like, oh, you're one of those. I was like, what does that mean? Hit, like, w- as soon as I started singing, he noticed that my volume went down. Mm. And he could tell, because he's right there behind the Was concert. that Frank Sass? Yeah. 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 God, was, <laughs> God, we lost him. We lost Man, him. Man, I, yeah. he, one of, one of the best. Like, But his reputation preceded him, because he would take, he did not, he told you what he thought. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, at that, I was old enough at that point to appreciate that, take that. And, and, and ever since then, I mean, that's all it took was one well-timed constructive criticism to say, oh, I had not, because how am I supposed to know that? I, I'm just feel I'm just singing. And I'm, when I'm singing, your ear completely goes to melody and the drumming becomes automatic. Like I know these songs, even if it's kind of syncopated and I'm singing that melody or the harmony or whatever, yeah. I don't realize that now I'm playing 10% lighter, but he can tell because he's not getting the same. It's maybe it's not hitting his gate the same way or whatever. Frank, uh, hey, oh, you're so, one of those. And then, and then, I can hear him saying yeah. that, man. And, and, and like uh, he would say, "Hey, we're gonna sound check. Just don't say anything but one, two, please." <laughs> he was like, "Say anything but check one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. So I started. That's when I actually started using different things. Anyway, and I, I, I tell people whenever they, I got a test, I'm like, "Tell me what you had for breakfast." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I started like just uh, speaking old like '80s rap tunes, like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air or something like that. You know, just to get something on the mic. But yeah. and then after the gig, when when like uh, we finished and I, we were talking about you know, video games. And like, he was just the cool, he was a salt of the earth dude that just was there to just give a damn was busted. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. um, the singing part, I actually attribute a lot of my consistent work to, because if I get called for a gig downtown, usually they know I sing and I can sing 10 to 12 or 15 songs on lead, but you're adding that third part. Or if they don't know, I sing, I'll be sitting in behind a band at a, at a Broadway gig or something. And they'll hear that third part come and they'll be, yeah, where did that come from? And it's so just, it's taking uh, one of your strengths and and, and marketing it. Like, oh man, I I've I've and what one of the more um kind of um uh, like I, I another I've made it moment or a very rewarding moment personally was when I got an audition with Love and Theft was my first like real audition. Yes, uh, in a, in a, like that that I really kind of wanted. And they opened for us in two thousand and eight. Yeah. Oh cool. wow. So yeah. I, I start. I played with them two thousand thirteen and fourteen. Nice. Right before Lauren. And um, it was uh, it was wonderful to go in there, study the songs. I went on YouTube and looked at the live performances too. Like I did Smart. the prep and wanted it, and like went in and just like, and I felt like I nailed. I was like, if I don't get that, then somebody else really deserves it. Yeah. But I didn't sing on that gig, and they hired me anyway. So that was a that was something that was like, oh, it was nice. validating as a drummer to say, okay, you brought whatever you do as a drummer is something valued here, and not just saying I never sang on that gig. And there's a they're a vocal group too, right. and I was like, oh, okay. So yeah. you did get some experience playing on Lower Broadway, and are you still doing it from time to time? Uh, it's I would say more than time to time. Like Lauren's off for a couple of weeks. I'll I think I have twelve shows in the next two weeks. Twelve, so thirteen a, shifts. A wide variety of bands, or do you have a couple of like there's benchmark bands? There's one artist named Shana G. Uh, she's very kind of uh, she calls it the alternative country. Nice. It's uh, it's kind of like f- the female version of that Zach Bryan like uh, thing, and she's fantastic voice. Got a little grit to it a good writer. Um, and so I've been playing with her for since COVID really right after COVID her drummer left town and like, I just kind of snuck in on some of those shifts. And then she's been, I've been her, her first call guy for a while. And yeah. it's great because what are the rooms that she plays? So she plays whiskey row a lot. Okay. Um, afternoon shifts, whiskey row, bar stool, a little bit of Casa Rosa where Miranda's place. Yeah. And it, man, I'll tell you what, there's no other place in the world that you can go down to, you know, play for three and a half hours on a, on a Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon make a few hundred bucks and sleep in your own bed. And like, do if you wanted to, you could play a double and like add to that or like, and, or if not, you just go, you know, you kind of made your day. A couple of hundred bucks. It, yeah, right. Isn't it amazing? A couple hundred that's bucks. That's crazy. Well, yeah. it's, more than, it's more than that. I don't know if I should, but like, I mean, right. she averages, but you know, if it's uncouth <laughs> to talk about money here, but like. Do it. I, Words I, it all, man. I, like I mean, we, we heard, because these kids are coming and the classic, um, the question is, 
do I play lower Broadway or not? I'm like, it's do it of, all, kid. Well, man. Here's the thing: is that kind of is it necessary? Do you is it a uh, like a rite of passage? It's a way to be seen. Yeah. It's not. I don't think it's necessary. I do think for musicians, it is. It is for me. It was a great place to cut my teeth because I played there right out of college. Like yep. out after college, I was I joined Hot Shell Ray and like was doing that. They were doing their thing. We're kind of we're kind of like figuring that out on the side. I was like making a little cash. That back then it was a little cash. And I needed it though. I needed that experience behind the drums because I was not great back then. I was just hanging on for dear life and I needed that. And I, again, I play with friends that were like, okay, how does check yes or no start? And like, you know, he'd come, come off the mic and tell me, okay, take a goon. Okay, I can play that. <laughs> and so it, it because you I can't know, go wrong with Spash Bagadoo. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know any of those songs. <laughs> no, I didn't no. listen to the country. That's so great. anyway, That's I, Eddie Bears, you know, it's like yes. amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I would say that. Broadway for me, and it still is a relationship that I will continue to play because the couple hundred bucks is now three to 400 bucks a shift. And yeah. there's some guys that at play at Kid Rocks that's like massive bar where you pretty much constantly have the tips running and they'll make, they'll break, they'll break a thousand dollars a night in just a three and a half hour shift. That was and, like unheard of 21, 20 years ago. When yeah. I did it, we, yeah. I'd go home with $8. Oh no, there's times I went home and like the only, the only I, I got, thankfully got free food at the bar and then went home with like 10 or 12, or 12 bucks after gas and parking or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. At, on Tuesday night at Paradise Park, to, you go downtown tonight to to Broadway. It'll, it would look like an old Saturday night, you know, back then. So. Oh my God! So another another uh, Kevin Bacon moment. Six degrees is mm -hmm. that you and I are connected in such a way that remind me of your relationship because this gentleman gave me a beautiful quote in the book, uh, my book, uh, Making It in Country Music. Is he your uncle, Mr. John Hamlin? He is my uncle. Okay, yeah, so John Hamlin, brother. if you guys don't know, is a kind of uh, uh, iconic figure in the Nashville music industry, and he's very connected to CMT, and he was very involved with 60 Minutes as mm -hmm. a producer, and he managed Hot Shell Ray. Yeah. So tell us, and Hot Shell Ray, were you, you were the drummer in the band. Yep. But now where was Jamie? The So... Jamie was the little brother of the lead singer, yeah, you know, right. And Ryan Jamie, and Jamie follows. Yeah. Him. Jamie was the guy. Jamie was like just a little brother that was always hanging around. We loved having him around. He was cool. Like yeah. just hung around. I just wanted to be with his brother and like his brother's in a band. Like that's cool. Right. So, um, but so I actually brought John in and that like, cause I'd been like right out of college. I literally was like, okay, I'm starting to learn how to play drums. And I'm, I think this could be something that I can do. And I literally just went to the bulletin board in the school music and was like, Oh, let's see here. Um, what's this? Here's an ad. Like this is, says, I want to like looking for drummer, looking for drummer, looking for drummer. Drummer wanted. Right, drummer wanted. And I pulled two tabs. One was uh, singer songwriter with production team looking for drums to fill out blah blah blah. So I went to that. It was Ryan. It was Keith. It was Keith Follis. Keith Follis. The first one I pulled off. Yep. And um, and the only reason I was there was I was showing because it was it was kind of in the summer. I'd already graduated. I was showing my buddy Belmont because he was thinking about going there. So I just pulled pulled the number off, called Keith, and he said, "Yeah, I'm just I'm looking for this for my son, blah blah blah. Uh, here, uh, you know, I'll send you what's your email. I'll send you the songs, and here's the address. Uh, next week, come play play these two songs for us. Amazing, like, perfect. Well, I pull up to their house in really nice Brentwood neighborhood, like castle. Yeah, the entire basement, <laughs> which is probably the size of this, like the first floor of this place, is yeah. a studio. A recording studio. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I mean, green as I could be, and like. And of course, I'd been in studios. Belmont, thankfully, had the experience. So I was a little bit less of like, okay, act like you've been there moment. And I was prepared and and like learned the songs. They were really cool. Like they had a kind of a Maroon 5 vibe with yes. a little bit of pop rock. I mean, you played the drums on those demos that I learned. I got I to gotta get a copy of that early stuff. That's crazy. You know what? I actually, I'll, I'll let you know. If I find it, I'll send them to you. I have wow. CDs. I have some old CDs of songs that I learned. Okay. And um, anyway... I learned the songs. I played. They're like, yeah, sounded great. We'll call, we'll give you a call. And like, so before I knew it, they were bringing me over and it was just me and Ryan yeah. in this little tracking drum room with him on acoustic because he needed to learn how to play with drums. And I, we had to click there and I was holding my own and I felt good. And I wasn't trying anything too crazy. Yep. Just playing the songs. <laughs> and then there was a few iterations of bass and guitar. Jeremy Davis of Paramore was one of those. They were good. Ryan and Jeremy were great friends. Yep. Um, and... Uh, a guy named Jonathan Ferrari, who's a songwriter now, and he was he played guitar, really good guitar player, wrote with Ryan too. They had a good relationship. Then we kind of settled, then then they met. I don't know how Nash and Ryan met, but Nash Overstreet and Ryan met at some point, and they just clicked. Because Paul Overstreet is is Nash's father. That's so right. Paul wrote like 
think my tractor's sexy. And yes. if you say nothing at all, it's kind of like know. Nick Collins's band. It's all like superstar children. It kind of was. Yes. And then you got, then randomly Ian Keggy, Phil Keggy's son yep. pops in and, and it's a fantastic musician. And so here I am like, Hey guys, like I just want to play drums. It's really cool. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun. They were super, they were really cool. But we were, they were about four to five years younger than me. And so I was working full time and like driving to Franklin almost twice a week to rehearse. And, and they were just, you know, writing songs and kind of living their lives, which is, you know, is what it is. Yeah. Um, and we did the whole, we went to New York, did showcases. And so like when I remember talking with my uncle at a family reunion thing, and I was saying this band I was in, I let him listen to a couple songs. He was like, I wonder if they'd be interested. So I, they, he met with Keith and Ryan and they liked what he had to say. There's and, a wasp in here. Woo. Is there? Oh yeah. Well, don't agitate it. Well, he was up on the crown molding there. So hopefully he's <laughs> far away. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, guys. Let no, me know if he's coming. Good. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Um, and he's about to sting you. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, um, don't look behind you. Yeah, stay very still. So so you recommended John to manage them. Yeah, I, I brought John in. He wanted to hear, he wanted to meet Ryan, wanted to hear him live. Because okay. John always, he'd worked in, done, I mean, he did 60 Minutes for years and done stories on U2 and the Rolling Stones several times. Yes. And, uh, I believe Prince, and I want to say, but then like, uh, also like Bobby Bowden and, and Kobe Bryant and like and he's the mastermind behind the crossroads concept and let's see him. Yes. And so this is way before the scene that the Nashville was on his radar. He just wanted to manage a band. He'd always love music, but he can't carry his tune in a bucket. He just knows how to, he's great with people. He's good at what he does as a producer. Yes. He worked at ESPN. He's done the whole thing. So he came in and wanted to be involved and it just was really, really great to have him there. Um, it didn't work out for me in the being in the band, which at the time was devastating, but now I get it. And, um, and they, because they we had done several um, trips to New York and showcases and had some signed some de deals that fell through and so I signed a record deal and then it didn't fall it fell through because this reason this guy signed this deal and so it just kind of was it, it never quite hit and then they they took about you know two years off and during that two years of like trying to figure out what they wanted to do they they parted ways with me and then Jamie the little brother who had been practicing his butt off yeah. and like had been playing he kind of slid in there and like was playing more and they just went with that and it was yeah. I'm just, I'm happy for him and they had a great ride a couple years later when they had a massive hit so there was there was a record deal and what was the hit it was like a hot ac tonight, thing tonight tonight there's someone there turning on the fire in the sun tonight whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. Man, catchy as heck I mean, now is there is are they still a thing uh, they got back together. They broke up. They got dropped. Got broke up. Got back together. I'm not sure. They're, I think Nash is producing a lot out in L.A. Ryan is still writing and playing. He got a little country deal. I think he's got a, more stuff going on right now. I think he's might have a little duet going on. These I remember that he tried to make a go of the country thing. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. uh, I do not know what Jamie's doing. I yeah. think Jamie uh, like I uh, and Ian. Ian left the band right after like Tonight Tonight kind of started to dip. He just was. I think he wanted to do his own thing. Um, and that's pretty much all I see. I haven't seen many of them. I saw a Keith and um, his wife recently, my, my gosh, recently, maybe a couple years ago. Adrian. Out. Adrian, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, saw them recently. And um, But they're all, they're, they're always they're always very nice to me, very respectful to me. And That's like, great. I, I, I had so much experience in that studio with them. Yeah. Uh, like getting those hours, though, because we recorded any songs that were written after he played on them. <laughs> we, we played... <laughs> um, he, he wanted the band to track and I had so much experience just getting in the studio, learning how to play with the click and what Phil's worked. And Keith really gave me constructive criticism yeah. on, on like, I would hit a Phil. He's like, that's what I want. That's the Beatles Phil I'm looking for. That's good the day, kind of thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, when, before there had been some producers that he had brought in that just didn't, I was like, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't, speak I don't, their language. I don't respond to this. Yeah. Like, you know, what do you want me to do? Like, yeah. I'm, you're not paying me to be here. I'm doing my best, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And so, anyway, I learned a lot, and I really appreciate those days, those years of 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 getting to where I am now. That is amazing. And so mm -hmm. now you're with Lauren, and she's a she's award winning. She's like a a a survivor of the um, American Idol, yeah, you know, fortress. And you know, my relationship, but she's just such a nice person, and she's so talented. It seems like we went, we've gone back. I'm looking, trying to hear my notes. Um, my kind of party tour. Uh, Jason and Luke Bryan, she was out with us. Yeah. And then she did dates on the High New Neo t Neon Tour 2018, which seems like a lifetime ago. And then dates this year on the Highway Desperado Tour 2024. Mm. Now, the My Kind of Party Tour in 2012, that was a young man named Adam Silverman. Now, do you know Adam? Did, did he pass Adam. the torch to you? I've never met Adam. Or was there somebody in between? There, what, what I think happened is, so after, the, after that tour with Luke and Jason, um, she 
decided to take a year off to get vocal surgery. She'd had nodes on the vocal cords. Ugh. And she'd actually had them on idle, but she had some poor management advice and they were like, no, you got to push through, you got to push through. Well, management just wanted to kind of like no, we're capitalize. capitalize, which I get. Yeah. She really needed to take some time off. Yeah. And so she finally did and got the surgery, healed the right way, did all the vocal rehab the right way and came back stronger than she was before. Yeah. And the whole time is just writing songs. And so she, she, Universal kept her. They didn't drop her at that point. They were like, all right, we're going to stay behind you. We're going to keep you around. And so then when she was ready, they were like, let's get a band. So all those guys in the previous band, Adam included, were like, yeah, we're, you know, we're obviously doing other things. So she had auditions and I was not part of that either. I didn't even get, I didn't get a call. I didn't even know it was happening. I was with uh, an artist named Chase Bryant at the time. Okay. How, how, how long did you do that? About a year. Nice. Uh huh. And then, um, when that kind of faded as well, I like, uh, I was a free agent, was playing with a band called Striking Matches. They were doing some European stuff. Like, Oh, yeah. They did a TED Talk, too. Yeah. They did a TEDx Talk. I saw that. Sarah and Justin, yeah. two, two they're fantastic musicians. Like, my first Red Rock show was with them. Nice. Opening for Train was amazing. Like, I mean, talk about a watershed moment there, too. Like, yeah, I love Train. Um, I, lo I love Red Rocks. Oh, my gosh. The best. So, Whew. anyway... Um, so I was kind of a free agent and I got a, uh, an email from one Rich Redmond at like two in the morning, which I thought was hilarious, but I was up of course. And I see the, the email pop through. It says, Hey, uh, got your name from, I think you said Adam, but Adam must've got my name from someone else because probably the, the drummer who got the gig, um, Phil Lawson, who was, was Kelsey, was with Kelsey for a long time. Now he's That's doing, right. some, now he's playing with Post Malone in that, in that group. Okay, wow. group. And so, so he took a he had he had a had to a, a family event or a wedding or something he had to be in so he needed a sub for one of those dates because he had gotten the gig with lauren and um it was he was like hey can you do uh, july 28th with lauren elena in san diego and uh, yeah well, i said i just responded I was like sure can it's like cool so like two or three months ago this is this is about six months in advance i say two or three months solid two three months go by i have not heard anything from anybody not your fault obviously you've just you said he can do it cool I think I may have gotten an initial like response from management that said, glad to have you. We'll send you material, like whatever. I mean, week, week. And I'm like, uh -huh. okay, what's going on here? And haven't heard anything. Not no flight. It's getting like less than a month out. No flight information, no uh -oh. like anything. And I'm turning down like work because one, I wanted to follow through on my, on, on my commitment that because I mean, you're the one that rec essentially I'm thinking I want to make, I want to follow through for your reputation as well. Cause yeah. I'm not, I mean, it's, you make those decisions as you make them. Oh, I wish I'd been more hands on that. I'm sorry. Not your fault. Yeah, it's yeah. not your fault. But just the, 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 the clout that you brought to the table was one of those things that I wanted to make sure that I, it's like, you know what, I, I'm doing this. I, you know, I'll stick to this. So sure enough, a couple weeks later, I get the material, we get a day, we get the, it all happens. I, yes. I auditioned, which meant I basically went. Played a live show. And I, well, it was, um, I went to SIR, I think, or maybe it was Soundcheck and with Tico, the band leader, Tico Hernandez. We love Tico. The best, the best. And he's, it was him, the computer with the tracks, and me. And we just played through the set. And he was like, all right, it's not a good. And it was his birthday, for crying out loud. Bless his heart. Oh, awesome. He, and, and like, I want to say that two days later, no, it was something else, but like, uh, it was his birthday that night. So we had a birthday party to go to. And so then, yeah, I got on a plane a couple days later, played the show. And they're like, all right, great job. If we need you again, we'll call you. Nine years later. go by. Well, and then, so I just kind of went home thinking, you know what? If something were to happen to that guy, that drummer, like this would be a pretty cool gig. Like it's just up and coming the whole thing. Like I really enjoy the group and it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. And sure enough, about two weeks later, I was kind of in talks with a few other things that were coming through like, Hey, can you do this tour, this tour? And then her management calls and says, we're doing a radio tour. It's six weeks. You know, it's Monday through Friday. It's kind of opposite, but we're, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. Here's the rate, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. And then now the rest is history is six, you know, nine years later, I'm nine years. And it's, it's crazy. I mean, she's such a talent. She sings so great. Such a nice person. She's like the duet queen, man. The like I'm looking queen, at here, yeah. Dustin Lynch, Lainey Wilson, Corey Kent, John party, Kane Brown, Hardy. There's probably more. Rascal flats is in there. I think she did one with Jason even, but it wasn't a single. It really. So can you do some of these songs in this? How do you do it in the show? So we do almost all of them. The, the Dustin Lynch one, through some pol political stuff uh, with Universal stuff, she's not, she's on, like, you'll hear some versions with her on it and some with Mackenzie Porter on it. Mm. So we've decided not to do that one. Yeah. But all the other ones we we kind of do. Um, uh, who especially the ones who that, sings the other part? Well, so she'll sing both, like, on the What Ifs. What Ifs is the big one. She'll sing the verses, because on the What Ifs, the feature, she kind of did some ad libs and just sang on the chorus. So any of those ad libs or call and response, I will sing the other part, but it's like, it's kind of re roles reversed a little yeah. bit. Yeah. 
on the John Party one, she sings both verses. And okay. um, the, we're just just going to ins- be doing the Corey Kent one. We just got word that we're going to start learning that one. You know, put that one down to learn. Yeah. It'll excuse me. It'll be in the set. So uh, she typically we we might change the key up or down a half step depending on where she needs to go, and she'll just sing both. Wow. Okay, and I didn't know that. Now it's very interesting because, like I said, she is so good, and she's been around since 2011. The debut is 2011. Wildflower. And you could tell that sound has changed mm-hmm. since then. It was a little bit more traditional, a little bit more, there's some more like a lot of ganjo, fiddle, a little bit more, you know, jum, 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 you know, um, Kalijah sounding, you know what yeah. I mean? And then it just has gotten slicker and slicker. And then she's got the 90s ladies thing and yeah. it's just like disco. So stylistically, you are all over the place, man. Uh, it, what's funny is when I was in high school and like learning music and like country was like the devil. Yeah. Like it was like, ooh, country. It's like I, we had a band trip to Dollywood my <laughs> senior year, and I walked around the whole place with like finger, just being a do, yeah. a doofus. Like, I mean, come on, like who does that? But that was just you know just being a kid, I yeah. guess. And come to find out, I've made my living playing country. Yeah. And um, my senior year in college, it was. I'm sorry, my freshman year in college, yeah. um, they do Belmont does this thing called Best of the Best Showcase. So every year they have little smaller showcases and the best of those showcases plays at the end of the year at the Ryman. All right. So it's a really cool opportunity for college kids to play a nice professional, like a world renowned venue. Yeah. And they bring a headliner in every year, usually someone connected to Belmont somehow. And that year it was Brad Paisley yeah. and it was just him and a guitar. And I swear, like I was up, I was sitting, I'd played, uh, at the, I'd played earlier. I'd played saxophone and with this gospel band <laughs> that won the gospel showcase. So I got to play the, my first time playing the Ryman was on tenor saxophone, which is hilarious. Yeah. So I play saxophone. I go up and watch the rest of the show and Brad comes on and just like what he would, what he was able to translate with his voice and just a guitar as good as he is. I was like, Oh, I get it now. Duh. Like open your mind, bro. Like this is, this is a very viable art form and genre of this. And like, he was just so good. Yeah. And so I kind of changed my perspective. And so flash forward to like playing drums and country, like obviously Jason's got a, got his niche and he's nails it. Like there's been some imitators try to come up, but it's just, you can't do it. Like yeah. what Jason does and what you guys do as a band. Cause you, I mean, come on, like it's just Jason Aldean, but the sound is all of you guys. Been like, around you, a while. you all yeah. bring your, yeah. you bring your flair, you bring your own personality and it, you can see it. And Jason, I, from what I can tell, he wants that like and and that creative control yeah i mean sure he's got the ultimate word but you guys each bring your personalities and it's worked so well slightly democratic which is nice yeah and so that's i think if you're if you're gonna choose that's what you want like yeah i I just want to have some creative input these aren't my songs i didn't write these songs but if i say hey what if we took this course this intro like twice as long to this whatever like and so it's cool to be a part of a band with lauren that lets us do that yeah and the drumming is really just pop rock drumming. Now, who are some of these guys that are on the records? Or is it the is it the Lonnies and that era of guys, or is it is it like the Jerry Rose and the Miles McPhersons, or who's doing the jobs? I know that on the Road Less Traveled record, it was a lot of Aaron Sterling. Oh, gotcha. I want us, and then uh, there's a few other ones that I've at, and I can't remember. Can't remember. And she's given, and you and and she and Tico are giving you the ability to. Um, McCoy it up a little bit. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. And like, there's some, t- there's some stuff like she's recording with Jerry, uh, um, with, um, Joey the, Moy. Joey Moy. Thank you. Yeah. Her new producer. Now with right? with yeah. Big Loud. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, Jim, he was the guy, Joey Moy is the guy that is kind of like the brainchild behind Nickelback. And then he took some of that production savvy and used it with Florida Georgia line. Mm. Oh, okay. so you can picture like a sound. bombastic pop. It's very large MIDI drums. Oh yeah. And, and, so the the studio aspect of it, like learning those parts and I, you know, it's, it's been great to like, yeah, if, if I don't play exactly like the record, neither Tico nor uh, Lauren are like, what the heck? In fact, sometimes it, we kind of, it's nice to put our own little, and Tico's the same way. Like he'll, yeah. you know, there's been a couple of times where like on ladies in the nineties, the song you referenced, like yeah. it's very like, it's just four on the floor, 16. Yeah. It's like, but there's this weird, in the production, there was this weird, like, almost slightly swung, like, ox percussion track with a straight, like, it was very, when it's when it's produced, it lines up, it's great. Yeah. Pulling that off live with the tracks and one of the things. So we kind of dumbed that down a little bit, and like, straight forward. So things like that yeah. to make it more live accessible. Sure. And she lets us do our arrangements. And she also was very involved in some of the arrangements. Like, hey, we cool. Like, she's more of a musician than she gives herself credit for. Yeah. She thinks she's just she's a singer. a little acting, too, huh? 
acting, writes books. I mean, she's yeah. a Renaissance woman of, of all sorts. She's like newly married. Mm -hmm. I met her husband. Yeah. Uh, we were hanging out. What's that venue with the on the water there? That was oh, man. the golf. The golf. With the yeah. Shoot. I've, <laughs> Anyways, we were there, yeah. and Pittsburgh. we and I got to um, hang out and get to know Tico a little bit better. And we just like we're. It was just one of those smell the roses days. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to hang out afterwards that night, and it was like, oh, we got to L this yeah, out. Yeah, Canada. It's, yeah, we did. <laughs> We've been to Canada a lot this year, Jim, and it's very. But aren't only, you overdue for it? Well, and it, and what's nice about it though is that everything has been a private flight. So you'd like we go to the airport and you follow a flashlight, and oh, you, so you don't nice. have to go through any kind of a. You just get on the plane. There's a lady, and she's like, "Can I get you something?" It's like this is what I, this I, is I, entourage. I saw the story the other day. Yeah, yeah. you have to post it, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. It was actually from Jason. Jason yeah. put it. Oh, okay. I don't yeah. want to be the guy that's like taking a picture of me like getting on a private jet. It's yeah. like I'm just trying to drink in some of the. Fun um, perks of the world without like having to tell everybody. Do you see me enjoying some of the fun perks of the world? That is the Gen Z or Gen X and yeah. the millennial in us, like yeah. elder millennial. That I I'm so bad at socials, like because I just who like who really cares? Like it's almost like an arrogance of like you want to know what I'm doing today. Yeah. Here's what I'm doing. <laughs> who, I, you know, I you, you know, Greg things. Morrow. I did a, I did an article on Greg Morrow for Modern Drummer yeah. magazine, and I had to really sell him hard and pitch it to him. He goes, "Who's gonna read this?" I said. Tens of thousands of yeah. drummers that subscribe to this iconic magazine that's been around for forty years, and mm -hmm. you're you're like the feature story. He's like, he's so aw shucks. See, yeah. Here's the thing, you know? guys. I'll tell you right Greg now. Greg is aw shucks. That I think if you don't take advantage of it now, you're going to regret not doing it down the road. That's I a know good we point. have you to know? do it. That's a really yeah. good point, honestly. Because it's happening now. I've met a lot of celebrities in my life that I regret not grabbing a picture with. Okay, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's at the time, I don't want to bother them. Yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want, I don't need to be that. It's like, I met Queen Latifah one time. She was sweet, just a sweetheart. And I got, I, hey, you want to get a pay? I'm, I don't want to put you out, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I got to give it. it to my friend, Jim Riley. Over the 20 years he was with Rascal Flats, he always snapped the picture. And he's got the pictures. Mm -hmm. There have been so many professional athletes and actors and musicians backstage. Never. Yeah. Out. Never. I, I just, I, yeah. Cause I, I get not wanting to be that guy. But, but if they but, offer it, like she, right. it, then yes, I would definitely. Hey, do you mind yeah. taking a picture? It's not like, you know, you're coming up to them with the camera and going, hey, you're asking. If yes. they say no, not a problem. I completely appreciate it. Yeah. Especially, you know? And they've got to, there's a certain level of, of fame, celebrityism that when you're at that, when you're at a show, um, you kind of almost expect it. Yeah, a little bit, and yeah. I would think that if I am the Queen Latifah in that story, or the or you know whoever the celebrity, dude, if is. I were you guys, I'd be hiding, hiding a, I'd be branding myself by hiding a pair of sticks out in the audience somewhere. Let me know who finds it, tag me in the in the photo, and every night that you're on tour, let me know where you find the pair of sticks. Hey, now the That's current a, drummer in yeah. Train did something like that. He left a pair of drumsticks right at a venue for me, and he goes, "I'm trying to do this new drummer community thing. It's great." Right. So. He took a picture of kind of the area where he hid it in this venue. I'm like, great. And he goes, now, when you find it, you take those and then leave a pair of your sticks for someone else that's coming through the venue. I was like, well, that's, that's kind of cool. Fun, cute idea. Yeah. So I went to go look for it. It was like, there's like this shelf with cobble. Sticks, sticks were gone, man. Somebody's yeah, somebody, got somebody got them. Somebody, so got, somebody them. got them, man. But I thought it was kind of like a, like a, like a, a sweet thing. Another guy that was always really good about getting the photos um, you know, our friend Zorro, you know, and yeah. he was, you know, the original drummer with the new edition went on one of the original drummer with Lenny Kravitz, a dear friend of his childhood friend. We're going to get to connect. He's going to finally get to see me do my Jason Aldean gig that I've been doing for 25 years. He's coming out in Lincoln, California, which is a suburb of Sacramento. He's gonna come, my friend Zorro is going to come out and see me play. It's You're going to hang with him? We're going to hang. He's yeah. got a whole entourage coming. You know, it's good. It's so... There's such a leniency in our organization. They're so good to me because I have so many guests. You're yeah. that. You're the one. You're like Tico in our camp. You I'm the it's guy. Kind of, it's kind of. The I, you know, I never get on the guest list for some T reason. Tico ah. is. Oh, stop. Tico is a people person of the highest order. I've never like. Yeah. I've never met anybody like him, and and it's like. I I respect it so much because he genuinely just is because it's fascinating. Our job, we travel. I've, I mean, we can't, I can't tell you how many people I've met. Every airport I'm in, I'm walking around, I'm thinking on all of all the people or whatever. It's like all these people have their own individual stories and how did they get here? And you realize through that, through this profession, and he has mastered this, getting people to, to, 
he disarms the conversation, he disarms the room, and then you can just get to like, where are you from? What do you do? And all of a sudden, within a, within every third person he meets, there's probably some one or two degree connection with, it's it's unbelievable. He was at PRS yeah. Guitars recently, right? So I was, yeah. you know, following him. Um, and uh, I don't know who the president of PRS is. Oh, Paul Reed. So pa here's Paul Reed. <laughs> Paul, Reed, Paul Smith Reed Smith, by chance? So Paul Reed Smith, you could tell he's jamming with Tico in a photo, and you could tell that Paul is having the time of his life he's got this ear to ear grin and he it looks like he's got this pose and he's like mm. rip, dip, 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 dip. he's doing some chuck berry lick or something yeah. mm -hmm. and tico's just like and they're Dude. just laughing he's just a nice whenever, guy. whenever you just go on a tangent with somebody you realize after you meet so many famous people mm -hmm. they really do put their pants on one leg at a time you know except well, when what they, they do, do they make, make gold, gold records, records. That's right. <laughs> but i could but I mean, when that happens, like when we were in the studio, you were recording with uh, one of the albums with with Jason. Yeah, you know, he and I were actually in the green room just hanging out, and I'm like, I'm like, I was something came up about my HOA, and I got an email, and I go, gosh, he's, oh man, I, yeah, I said you, I said crazy question, do you ever serve on the board of your HOA? He's like, man, I can't stand HOAs, <laughs> and we started talking about HOAs. Yeah, it was the most random conversation. He's a, he's a, everything. He's a great. Con he's a great conversation. <laughs> he's a salesman, dude. Yeah, he's he a, is a salesman of salespeople. He's he's, he's yeah. a, he makes you feel like you're, you know, he wants you around. Yeah, you know, totally. Um, so some of the gear you play, dude, we have to do it for the drum nerds. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so I had your brands down here. You've got Gret the big. These are all big boys, dude. Gretsch, Remo, Zildjian, Vicverth. Those are like the, like, you know, just some of the most heralded brands. Mm -hmm. So for the kids that are always emailing me and you, <laughs> yeah. I'm ready for an endorsement. How I think, how do I do this? So did, what did, did you go to NAM? Did you pitch yourself? Did you put an EPK together? Did you meet people organically? How did it happen? Um, we have a, you know, Paul Allen, guitar player. Yeah. Ten Finger Orchestra. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's talk about talent, like drums, bass, guitar. Like he's fantastic. And yeah. he's been a, a good he actually played with Ryan at, for a very short period of time. He came out to like kind of see, and he was like, I think I know what this is. I got, I'm going to go make money. <laughs> Cause <laughs> yeah, anyway, so Paul and I developed a good relationship and I kind of was really green to the industry. And I would like, he, he, he would just, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and we'd go out to a storage unit and I would play, we, he had a drum kit set up. We kind of play, we'd go grab food, Baja burrito or something, and then go to his storage unit and just nice. like hash around a little bit and like, and I was so intimidated by that because I'm not a drummer's drummer. Like, I'm just kind of like, you know, ooh, that's cool. Why did you do that? Oh, it's just like a paradiddle, bro. Dude, like, you play yeah. the song, which is what so many trained drummers have trouble getting to. Right. Again, Flash kind of ties into the fact that I didn't learn traditional. I just learned listening to records. So that's how I thought that was going. You know? I like that. So with that whole thing, I, I literally just, uh, w w we met and he was like, hey, you come to, what are you doing these dates in uh, in January? I need you can be my tech for Winter Nam, and um, I was like, per okay, cool. So he I checked our guitars, whatever he was with at the time, and I got a little he got he got my credentials and everything, and we went we went out there and split the hotel room and the whole thing, Thanks. and like it was, I mean, I was, I gosh, that was probably two thousand and, I mean, it could have been nine, ten, eleven, twelve, like somewhere in there, even earlier than that, maybe yeah. like it was a long time ago, yeah. And I just, I saw Josh Freese play in the lot, one of those lobby shows at yeah. the, you know, those two pr the hotels that are right yeah. in front of the convention center. And there's those, they have those lobby shows. Oh yeah. And I was like, I, it, I think that's Josh Freese. And he was playing with just some little, like, and it was just amazing. So, yeah. and speaking of Paul Reed Smith, uh, he took us up to his freaking hotel room where he had a bunch of his like project amps and he brought like 20 10 10 guys up there. Out, yeah. i got this one in that he had a separate room for like his like amp and then you know so it was just seeing that and so that was my initial but nam is so overwhelming like but did you pitch yourself did you go to the folks at gretch and you're like hey guys paul was very encouraging i just didn't have anything i felt like i had anything to offer like i'm just kind of playing broadway i'm playing in a van and trailer gig like country bars and casinos around the midwest like I mean, I'm I'm professional. I'm touring and I'm making money and making a living. But the but exposure I'm, quotient wasn't there yet. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I knew I didn't have much to bring to the table, uh, and this is before social media really is what it is now. So, yeah. um, Soul Tone Symbols yeah, was man. the one that I went to first, and like just kind of said, just kind of got up the, the nerve to talk to him. And their their a uh, whole vibe was for the working drummer, you know. And I was yeah. like, well, I'm the definition of that. So I basically went to them and. Um, and developed a relate, just start talking to him. And I got the info, emailed them and got some symbols and, uh, and it was great. And then as 
that kind of got the initial like crap out of this. Like, okay, you get the, get the jitters out. And then, yeah. uh, when I got, I emailed Gretch cause I got the info from the Gretch contact there from Nam, and I emailed them and said, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And they're like, they, the first, uh, response was, well, you know, we're not hiring, we're not uh, taking on any artists now, but you know, cause well, hold on to your information. I, right. I didn't have anything going on. So maybe a year later is when I got the gig with love and theft. And then I, then I got to the point where I was a little more bold with it. And again, this is 2013. So still very early on in the, in the whole scheme of things of like internet and um, social media. And I got the gig and we were on, we were opening for McGraw that whole summer. We had TV shows lined up, you know, today show, all that, all that fun stuff and all that stuff. I actually had some ammunition and I went nice. to him and told him and, and then, bef- sli- I was I was I remember crafting an email and I got a I got a text from my buddy Vince who he was an inst- he was instructing and stuff and he had a relationship with Vic Firth Vince Romanelli yes yeah yeah the, the, nice. another mayor of Nashville just the best and he was What's like up, Vince? Uh, I think it was Ben at Vic Firth at the time was looking for more um, uh, country artists to, yeah. to to bring on their roster and I was like you know what I just got this gig and so Vic Firth was actually the first one. Which in there in in kind of led to a Zildjian relationship, yep. and then I I emailed Kim at KCM Music at the time, which is what Gretch was under. Yeah. She, now Remo is a big fish that is hard to get. It, it's it, nearly impossible. How'd you do that? I think I've just grandfathered in, honestly. Nice. It was so long ago. Yeah. Um, because they also it was kind of there was kind of like a little familial relationship there, and I used I used the name dropping of Hey, I'm with Vic and Vic Firth and Zildjian, like you know looking for this. <sighs> And, and it's been, and I mean, the Remo relationship is, I, I, I just get a discount. It's very rare to get things for free these days. Yeah. Um, I get, I get an allotment of sticks for free, but it's not, you know, it's fantastic. And everything's just kind of discounted. So yeah. we're going to kill this amount of trees for you. <laughs> but um, so I guess it was just gradual. I got in kind of at a time where endorsements were a little more accessible yeah. and I just happened to get it at the right time. And I was able to kind of promote myself just enough without lying being like, hey, we're doing this and this and this, and say, I, you know, and they and they said yes, and that kind of led to a few other things. You know what I'm blown away by? That you put an ambassador on your snare drum and it makes it through the entire show, multiple shows. Mm-hmm. What's on the toms? Ambassadors as well? Uh, toms are vintage emperors. Oh, um, nice. A little oh, warmer. Yeah. Why yeah. an ambassador on the snare? I just think I get more, like, because my snare's a little drier. It's that hand-hammered yeah. chrome-over brass. Um, I've always, it's an ambassador X, so it is a little thicker than I think a traditional ambassador. Right. Uh, ambassador X. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little thicker. Um, I just, I really like how it feel. I get I the tone of the drum can come out more. I'm not choking off the, you know, t- the way I play, you know, like, I guess it just feels, you know, and yes, I do go through heads a little bit. Like it does, they start to lose their, I have to go through them a little quicker, I guess, as far as just losing their, like once every three days or so, or no, I mean, it's more like, I guess, well, because if we're, all, if we're only playing like 35 minutes or whatever, it can last, you know, six shows. Nice. Or, But I actually don't change my heads. I probably should change them more. Our front of house guy probably like me to change them more. Right. But again, even with a the discount, they're kind of expensive. And um, uh, I do, snare-wise though, I do try to keep one that's on there that's decent and it's not. Now, in that much. position, here's a business question. Mm-hmm. Be doing what you do, is that money come up? you have to pay for the heads or is that kind of a business expense for the artist? So I, I, I have not, um, I, I pay for the, for my stuff. Okay. Um, you know, yes, I'm playing that because the drums that I use with Lauren stay on a trailer. They stay on the, on the, on, on, in my trunks on a trailer. And I haven't played that kit other than with her in probably eight years. Well, that kit I got, actually, I got that kit on the tour with you guys that first time That's right. it I got delivered and brought it out. And the first its debut show was Madison square garden with the, when Jason sold it out. And that was nice. like, oh. wow. yeah, so that was pretty awesome. But so that kit has been pretty much played exclusively with Lauren since then. And that was mm-hmm. 2018, I believe. Um, so, the, you know, I don't, I, I just, I just use them. I buy them myself. I have right. not thought about, even though I'm using them for her, I think my gear is my responsibility. The computers and like the tracks and stuff, that's hers. Like she yeah. pays for that stuff that we use on stage. But I think like that, I guess I'm I'm comfortable with with uh, with my own purchasing purchasing my own heads and sticks. And now here's like another good dorky business question: sure. uh, Are you a W two with her or 1099? A W two, and okay. it's, it's a per gig thing. So we're not salary yet, but we right. I I don't mind show pay because it's you work you get paid. Right. Um, but, but it's, it's nice a, when they take their ficka fica out for and, you. And I do appreciate the W two because um, well, I was thinking from tax deduction. And as a self employed musician, that has really helped me get. I got, Loans. Well, I bought a house in 2006, yeah. and then yeah. bought another one in 2017, and I'm got a construction loan coming. Like it's, it, it enabled me to have some consistency to say, 
here's what, yeah, I mean, I'm claiming this X amount of cash from Broadway and stuff, but I also have this on paper and you, boom, that's text. And it's like, you can see it. Here it is. One last thing we wanted to maybe touch on was sure. you're, um, you did a lot of playing in house band. Was it for the CMA awards, the CMT awards? What? There's a C involved. There's a, one of the uh, alliterations or, yeah. uh, now, you know, and those things, the CMTs, gotcha. country music, uh, television awards. Um, but the story of that is hilarious, but uh, John Bollinger, right? Uh, John Bollinger's band leader. And mm -hmm. I get a call from John and in, again, I think this was like 2014 and he's like, Hey, I got your number from John Hamlin. I need a drummer. Like they're, they were switching from the Mavericks. The Mavericks were the house band forever. And they either, they, whatever happened there. I did not know that. They, wow. they, that year they switched and they wanted a different house band. Um, and they called John to put it together. Nice. Younger, you know, hip looking the whole thing. <laughs> and he called me for it and it's like live television are you you know have you done anything like that and like in the back of my mind i'm thinking no i have not i'm scared to death of it i do not know what is involved here yeah i'll do it yeah you know jump in the deep it was end one of the those pool. first and very uh i'm glad i said that because there's a part of me that says just say no if you're not ready to say no at least you're protected like you don't you're not going to embarrass yourself but then there's that moment that you're like no, I can do it. I'll figure this out and throw you through, you throw yourself in the fire and you got out. And then I was in it for eight, you know, eight years. And we yeah. would, you know, every time I had to take one year off when Lauren had a weekend of her headlining tour and I had, to, I couldn't do it that year. Um, but other than that, it's been every year since. Yeah. And then what are the responsibilities? Are you, you're backing up artists on kind of like modified condensed arrangements. And then are you actually going to commercial as well? Yeah. Those we kind of like bumpers. bumpers? Yeah. yeah. We, we, at the first few years we did bumpers live and then yeah. they decided to pre-record them. Bumpers. Yeah. And then we did, we, there was like a little side stage, the nationwide side stage or the Ram side stage, you know, the sponsored side stage of the up and coming artists that are not on the, like the main feature. Yeah. And they do like a freaking chorus or verse chorus, like something very 45 seconds thing as you go out to commercial yeah. and then we bring them back in. And so, yeah, we learned like six, usually six artists and we learned, and then they started learning the whole song because we did the whole song for like internet content. So you do the little bumper and then you do the whole thing and we'd pre-record it and the whole thing. So the the the, the nerve-wracking thing is that it is live we are the we play we are playing live and we hear that like in my ears i would hear the truck counting down from commercial we would make notes as to which like where i should need to hit spacebar to start our click and start our tracks if we had them and it would like i would say at at five seconds because then that we would start right away and we'd be able to get out right in time for the for the you know for the yeah. mc is of that the night. something that someone had to teach you or just instinctively know Got that into it I just did it. Yeah. And like, I, I took to it really well. And like, I just, my mom is a actress and she did a lot of theater work. And there was just this moment, there's just these moments of like timing that I do feel like come naturally for me. Yeah. Um, like when Lauren's introducing a song and she goes on a tangent and I'm like, and I can tell when she's about to wrap it up. But I, obviously if she says, here's this song and then you hit space bar and it's like one, two. Seems one. like forever. Oh my gosh. So it's like, blah, 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 one. Two, here's the song about not done. Two, it's right in time. Bam. Bam. And it's in. It's like, it, there's a, there, and I was, granted, it's, it's never, it's sometimes it's not perfect, but when you get it within, it's, it's, man, it was the first show was, I was so nervous, but when it landed and we were done, it was just, again, so rewarding, right? It's just, um, and I'm just very grateful for nice. to, to have that because. No, you always it, sounded it great. Yeah. Do, do you, and then, you know, you learned how to read music notation from playing the saxophone. So do you have your own version of drum charts? I do. I, 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 it's mostly just like, you know, going on. I don't, I, I, there's some great softwares out there now that I haven't uh, really had some practice with, but I literally just kind of put a title and a tempo and how it starts and then put like an intro and like space it out so where I can look, glance at it. Yeah. The kick and snare drum pattern, pattern and then sometimes the, the number of bars. I really rely on my, I really rely on listening to the songs ad nauseum sometimes yeah. to get those parts. But if I, if I think I'm going to really need to remember that, it's like, okay, it starts with boom, boom, or like four on the floor kick or, yep a big hit on four before the whole band comes in. And I will can notate that with accent marks, usually on a computer, then throw on an iPad and have it there if I need it. And I can yeah. swipe back and forth. Well, it's a good skill set. It says and you had less than 48 hours notice to set for Cole Swindell's drummer and play their 90 minute set for 30,000 people <laughs> headlining at the Barefoot Music Festival. Yes. So, so you had to have charts. I did. Yeah. I did. iPad, paper. iPad. And nice. um, so, yeah, I was on the, I was out with Lauren on, on, on the bus with Lauren. Like we are, we just, and I get a call from Chris Marcor who's fantastic dude, great player. He's been, I think he's Cole's band leader. He's been with that Cole since the beginning and he's having a baby. And he's like, man, we're close enough that I don't want to risk it. I was thinking next week I could start because he had he had him lined up for the the red zone, if you will. Yeah. But this was a little peripheral date. And he was like, man, I just don't feel comfortable leaving town. Can you do it? And it was Tuesday and the first show was Thursday. Yeah. 
And I was like, again, there was one of those moments, the same thing with the CMT call. I was like, I, I need to say no because all those dudes are my friends. We toured with them. Actually, it was Cole, Jason, Cole that year, 2018. Cole Swindell's That's first right. headlining tour of like <laughs> hockey arenas and basketball arenas. Yeah. And then you guys in the summer and then them. One of our best years touring, honestly, because we had the great catering and like it was great. <laughs> Lord Marquard. And so I was like, I, I said no at first. And then within like 10, I thought, I, I talked to Tico and he was, I was like, we can do it with the dates line up. And we're, we were playing in, in Buffalo or something, or I could get there. The, the logistics would work out. Nice. So for me to get to that. And I was like, you know what? I called him right back. I was like, I'll do it. I'll do it. Send me this. Stuff. Let's, let's make this work. Yeah. And again, from you then. You saved the day. You're from, the hero. Yeah. I mean, and I, because I love those dudes, like Joel and Clint and, and Josh and like, uh, Adam Cunningham has sub, he's a bass player. He's, he's come and played with us when our bass player had a baby one time. And I mean, Cole is the nicest dude in the world and like their whole crew and everybody, it was just so nice to like be acknowledged for that. And, um, uh, our Lauren's assistant is engaged to, uh, Cole's assistant tour, tour manager, Cody. And so like, it was, it was the best situation that I could Cody go Sigmund? into. Uh, Cody Alexander. Okay, sorry. Area. Sorry, I'm popping the mic. I'm getting all excited. <laughs> I know. It was the, so literally I get the call, I get the music, I'm in the gym listening to it. I'm making, I'm making my charts at first. It helps you retain a little bit. And then, but to get there, there were no flights or anything. I had to take a city bus from Manhattan to Jersey Oof. over not like 9 PM me and actually our front of house and our production manager. Cause he was the stage manager It's another serendipitous thing. And which made it so he was the stage manager for the barefoot festival. This is a massive live nation festival. This is like a, in, in Wildwood, New Jersey it's yeah. on the right on the beach. He was asked to be the stage manager that week. So yeah, a travel partner. I, so we got, we took the same bus and like a uh, city bus, a city bus. Cause it was the only thing that we could do to get me there. And then he had a hotel room in Wildwood. And so I just, and it was one of those rooms that had like, it was two separate rooms in the one room. It was like a suite style. Yeah. So I had a room to go to. We, 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 uh, we bust to somewhere and then we had to take an Uber for like a, like an hour Uber that was like a hundred bucks from the bus station to get to Wildwood. And then I basically went, he had to be up early. Thankfully our sound check are like, wasn't until like 10 AM. So, but he had to be there like 7 AM. So I get up, I get the runner from Col Cole's runner picks me up from the hotel. I get there. And I sit down and, and like we do a sound check and like we hit a couple of songs and like because Johnny, our production manager, was the stage manager, he kind of like, you guys can have a couple extra minutes if you want. And we, we hit a couple of songs and Joel Hutzel, guitar player, he was like, are you good? You want to say, man, I'm pretty good. And I just remember on that bus, listening, 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 just absorbing, it, absorbing it and just like focusing so much and because and like making certain making all the notes I needed and then like reducing that and then listening the day of and the day of and then. I made one mistake that was nobody noticed except for the band yep. on one of the endings. It wasn't, there was no train wrecks and like, and then that's it, the first show just again, Wildwood, like 30,000 people headlining this festival. It's just the largest show I've ever played for as the yeah. band. And I was just like, and you just kind of sigh, a, a huge sigh of relief. And like, you came through for your friends, you know, yes. and, and your people that, and, and it's very rewarding as a, and it was, it came at a time where as a performer, I was kind of, I kind of needed that little win. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the next night it was a whole weekend. So like I played the next night, well, it got rained out very similar to our show um, on the weekend that we did that got rained out and shortened up. So we all had to do like acoustic sets and you guys played full band. Yes. We, Cole ended up doing an acoustic set. So like I had to kind of, there was no tracks, like, like Joel counted each song off. So I had no rails anymore. It was just me knowing the songs and Joel would go in the talk back and count the songs off for me because he knew kind of where they were. That was awesome. And we played the songs. And I had like rods. We just used the normal kit, everything because everything was mic'd. They lost, because of the rain, they lost some of their gear so they couldn't play their electrics. Oh boy. We got through that show. That was another win because they're like, you got to be adaptable. You got to be able to, to have the, the ability to do that. And then the third show was normal and we played it great. And it was yeah. just, I mean, it was so awesome to be able to do that. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I love, and see, because he, he has a musical mind. And you're responsible and you hold yourself to a high standard and you can make the drum charts. You got to experience the Kenny Aronoff lifestyle, you know, oh, man. a city bus to an Uber to the festival to mm -hmm. playing on someone else's drums, getting it done, being the hero lives for that. Oh, and I had, I didn't have my, uh, I had, I had like generic ears cause my other ears were on the, like it was one of those, one of those moments where everything just was, was against me, but it all worked out and was fantastic. I had the generic hundred dollar sure in ears on Saturday night live oh, man. with Sean Pelton <laughs> watching my every note three feet behind me. Remember when we had to do Saturday night live yes. after the Vegas shooting, yeah. uh, we had no gear. And so it was like, I had stock hundred dollar, like dollar general <laughs> in ears. You know uh, what I mean? Humanity. It's not like you're listening to your mix through a, yeah. you know, a no. two-way radio. It is crazy. <laughs> so um, 
so this is where we kind of go for the uh, the Fave Five. Jim, I'll let you ask some of these questions. All right. The Fave Five. Oh, okay. What's your favorite color? <laughs> go. <laughs> favorite color. Uh, favorite color is red. Actually, there you go. There you nice, go. dude. I love red, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I appreciate the the slightly darker a garnet, if you will. Oh, yeah, yeah, but he's very precise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're like gonna a, favorite, like a, you might like as well a, make it precise. Like a Mojave sunset. Yes. Yeah. Have Somewhere you ever had there. some some red drums? Because you your drums are white. I had a red sparkle drum when I first come like the bright red sparkle. Yeah. And also a Gretsch kit that I found on eBay for like six hundred bucks. The first like, pearl export was the red color. Oh man, yeah. yeah. The red. <sighs> so it was sparkle was just the red wrap. It was just a red wrap. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. That, I think like our high school, one of our high school like jazz bands had that same kit in the yeah. back of the you know the. And then the for some reason, it just you can never get it tuned well. I could never tune well, as you know. Was it an export? It was an export. Yeah, yeah. I think well, in any yeah, like like the composite shells, they weren't real wood. They were just like yeah, press board. They were why they were priced the way they. Yeah, were. Exactly. like the Arimo. Did you ever get to play a Arimo Acousticon kit in the no. in, in the nineties? It was basically the wood droppings that f- fell to the floor <laughs> from making drums. And, oh, like uh, w- uh, uh, sawdust, and they would come. They would <laughs> basically the wood glue, and glue these like, together, and that would those. Well, were the, Tama drums were like that too for a while. They had like cork board. It seemed like the interior was made out of cork. Yeah, yeah. you know, jeez, Tama. You don't hear about Tama drums a lot. Well, it's thing. all the metal guys, yeah. Charlie Benante, Lars, those guys. They, they did make them. a move at ten years ago to the country market, and so we've got like you know Jeff Marino and some of those yeah. guys doing and the thing. And they're great drums. Yeah, I, I have the. My pedal I play downtown is the Iron, Iron Cobra. Cobra. I mean, yeah. that's a workhorse. Man. Well, I mean, what they, a great they, name. They, it's funny because, I mean, uh, from a branding perspective, DW, uh, before they were a drum company, I remember even when they started uh, building drums and getting more emerged into the drummer's market and becoming a high-end, you know, BMW-esque brand, if you will, they were more of a hardware company known for their pedals. Yeah. Right? And uh, then they started making drums, which it's kind of like, until it was like McDonald's making steak, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, it, okay, I, I, I kind of, and then all of a sudden it just caught fire yeah. and they become known for both, right? Yeah. Uh, Tama did the same thing. I mean, with that, that pedal became ubiquitous. It and then became the star classic. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, I think I bought it <clears throat> at a necessity and I, I mean, I, I think it's 10 years old at least. Yeah. Rock and socks, same way. I have rock They're and socks. They're great. I've had. Yeah. yeah I mean, like, longevity out of those oh pedals man. is amazing. I, one of the screws kind of came loose. I, yeah. I When I carry my stuff downtown Broadway, it's like symbol back. Then I have a backpack that I sling around the front that's got my pedal attached to it and my sticks and ears and micro and some like extra felt and stuff. And then I carry my snare and carry my throne and just like a pack mule just running. But it keeps me in shape, but it's also like... It, it, the it's it's taken a beating and it still really just sounds great and it looks still looks great i mean it's it's, it's it, awesome yeah 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 i was just asked to host the dw factory day for the fifth time Ooh. and I, it's always on a saturday in september and i can never do of it of course but it's so sweet that, that you they tell, tell them all they it. ask <laughs> uh, no i would be i'd be introducing terry bazio and brendan yeah. buckley and jason Say, hey I, I have somebody i can't do it but i have somebody that is so would, would do it for a kit yeah <laughs> Because they're like, Rich, we don't want you to play. We just want you to just, you know. We want be a host. you. We want your personality. We, we just want I have you to my introduce co-host. people that play. I have my co-host who I never invite out to shows or bring up on stage. Ouch. I got to do this for him. Ooh, on stage? Yeah. Buddy, you come up and you can play Hicktown. Let's come, do it. Come on. We'll make, right. it. It's, we'll make it. It's not public record. I, I, yeah. We'll okay. make it happen. And it's on. I'll yeah. play Hicktown. Yeah. I'll freaking kick its ass. Yes, you will. If I'm there, I'll if I'm freaking, close, I'll cup cowbell I'm it. I've heard it. I'm going to turn it into turn it Hick Village. Oh, Durka, durka. Hey. What's your what's your favorite drink? We probably shared one. Am I like alcoholic drink? Well, you can go there because they're more fun. Um, I, you know, that's a great question. Um, what uh, kick are you on right now? What kick? What kick are you on? A gin kick, actually. Oh, yeah. Weird, yeah. right? Well, we went to Scotland um, a couple years ago. At like, did a headline tour, UK tour. It was awesome, I and mean, it was grueling because we, you know, it is what it is. But it was really fun. Like yeah. I, I'm just the kind of person that loves that. Like I will carry my gear up the stairs and play for 200 people in this stinky club in Glasgow, Scotland. Heck yeah! And sweat my ass off and play, like, and and just because that's I don't know that's how I grew up. That's how you did it. That's how you like that was rock and roll, if you will. Yeah. So I, and I, even in my 40s, I was back still, in like, my day. Oh, that's right. That's why I tried blood sausage. It's literally sausage made 
with blood. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I loved it. That was so, my nickname in high school. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Blood um, sausage. Blood sausage? I don't want to hear that story, but... Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm traditionally a vodka-based drinker, so like Moscow Mules are really good, or nice. like just vodka soda lime yeah. is, you know, something, but like, um, to, honestly, the drinking has slowed down these days, but like, uh, I, I stick, to, you know, tequila, I'll shoot tequila, chill tequila is great. Nice. Um, that's, I guess, if I'm on the road and like out of the bar. So white liquors, very good and good yeah. for your waistline because... You're you're a healthy, fit guy. What's your fitness thing? Um, so to my that first 2013, my first major gig, Love and Theft, opened for McGraw, and I think I was barely 30 years old, and if like maybe 29, 30. So again, I was late bloomer. Like I yeah. just like I was five or six years behind than that kind of like eight ball, if you will. And so I just kind of it was my not till I was 30 till I got on a big tour like that. Well, McGraw, as you know, is a fitness just fiend. And so that year was the that was the two lanes the of semi. freedom tour. Yeah, yeah. He actually didn't have the semi that year. Uh, it was, he had the, the one bus that on the bay. He had all the gear that came out of the bays. Nice. And he had a personal trainer slash security guy there. So every day was like a CrossFit day for him. And he would, I mean, four hours. He would wake up with my first day on that flipping tour. flipping tires and sledgehammers. And I get off the bus that. the first day in Birmingham, or not it was near Birmingham, but that that amphitheater that's in Atlanta or um, in Alabama. That's Greens Greenwood or Greenwood or something like that. Yeah. yeah anyway, it doesn't matter. I get off the bus and he's at like 9.30 a.m. I'm trying to catch catering before it's put, to, you know, the breakfast is down. He is coming back from his morning run with chains around his, like shirtless chain, massive chains around his shoulders, the bandana on the little running shorts. And he's just run the entire bleachers of this amphitheater in the morning. And that was his first workout of the day. Right. Then around one o'clock, he gets noon, he would get the gear out and him and his band would, and anyone who wanted to, and he invited us out to do this little kind of semi CrossFit, like, okay, this station, we're going to do shrugs, and then here's this little ladder climb, blah, 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 do a run, and we'll, kind of, we'll do three circuits of that, and we'll change it up. Nice. So he was running the workout, man, hitting the tire, the whole thing. And he's out there involved, like, giving us instruction. Like, I remember at one point when he invited us out, so it was me and, and Stephen and Eric from 11th F and our bass player, and, like, we all just kind of started doing it. And it was fantastic because I had McGraw as a personal trainer one summer, and it's great. it set in these kind of examples of, like, Okay, it was the time in my life where I needed that little like, oh, you have to take care of your body now because if you do want to be doing this 15, 20 years later, you'll end up looking like me. Well, so Jim, get I the mean, splash. There's, <laughs> th trust me, there's way worse. <laughs> oh, I know, um, but no, it, it's it's one of those things where I, I do have a lot of like you know genetic uh, blessings as well, predispositions, like, yes. right? Um, but I also didn't want to be skinny fat or just out of shape or just not feeling great, like cardiovascularly, not great or whatever. Yeah. And, and we're drummers, man. It's such a physical, the way you play the way, like you, you're, it's a full body and you play 90 minutes and your whole, like you're playing. And if you don't take care of yourself, it will hurt. So when I met you, well, I met you a long time ago, but when we we're on tour together in 2018, I'm 200% in better shape than I was then. Mm -hmm. uh, that year, I was just kind of like big beard, traveling too much, lived half of the year in Nashville, living on Southwest Airlines, and um, just and then I uh, just decided that whatever I was going to do, I was going to do it every day. Yeah. So the consistency. Yeah, and we saw saw you guys do like the first day we rolled up this last tour, like yeah. out there like doing your workout, like it, even twenty to thirty minutes of just some little circuit. It just at our age, it just like yeah. it really, really helps to. Get, and like we toured with Blake Shelton for almost a full year and they play basketball every day. And so it's just something he gets out there and it's, it's Blake. He's not, you know, he's not your, he's not a typical athlete by any means, but no. he's in he's good cracking shape. you up the whole time. Oh, he's in great. He's in good shape for his, for, for like, he's, he's all of us. He's super tall too. He's like just a little shorter than I am. So I always have to guard him. Of course, like you're going to put, and his drummer, Tracy Jeez. is a fantastic basketball player. He's like, his daughters are playing like he's, he's a yeah. good athlete. And so we, well, one time we were in Sacramento and we played at the Sacramento Kings arena and they let us use their practice facility. We decided to do a uh, full court for oh. about five minutes. And then we're like, it's, and that was like, oh, okay, I could just run down there. And like Blake's like, okay, um, let's just do half court. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Um, so oh, yeah. it's, it's funny that and your guys play pickleball and like, it's yeah. really cool to see that like, you, if you, you can make it a part and make it a band thing, it's a, it's a community thing. It's a bonding experience and it, it's good for you. No, I like that. My band is like, please play pickleball with us. I'm like, no. You guys are insanely overly competitive, uh -huh. um, and I get a thousand percent more benefits of having me against some weights. Or you against you, essentially. Me like, against yeah. me, mm -hmm. than being yelled at for screwing up a shot, because that is exactly what would happen. Because why, were, why don't you just play golf, then? Golf. That, that's a, you're against yourself in golf. Oh yeah, but it's also a ridiculous. It's a money pit. 
of frustration. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've just good enough now where I can like not embarrass myself. And it's, it's, it's actually a pretty good networking thing. Oh yeah. I've played with some, like, Hey, if they need a third or a fourth in this, like on the certain tours and you're, Oh shit, I'm playing golf with some pretty. Rich, you were a speed sp skater for crying out loud. You'd be able to keep up and pick a Is that true? He was. I, I did for a brief time. I, I experimented with some athletic things in Connecticut in my, you know, when I was eight, nine, 10, 11. Um, you ever see this guy roller skate? No. He's amazing. I'm oh, pretty good. Yeah. Like a, like a, like, oh, I'm good. bringing some blades easier. out next time, man. Dude, he's amazing. Go. I'm like a disco roller skater. It's uh, but you know, still, yeah. That that you could like play hockey or something. I mean, if you, uh, and skating is very good for you. Like, you know, yeah. it's good for the, the, yeah. the abs and legs. Yeah, heck yeah. Right. I think I'm doing good just to go get your your weights and cardio in yeah. every day. Call it good, mm -hmm. um, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to involve Jim in the favorite five. What's what's your favorite food? <laughs> <laughs> How did that's coming? Um, or just, dish. Or just text me these things. Food or dish? Um, that man, so many good ones. I will say, like, every time I get this question or that question comes up, which very food, like, it's not a style. My mother's squash casserole. I mean, oh. it's this, like, southern, she's very southern, southern cook. She, mom, from Macon, Georgia, which is where oh Aldi is. Yeah. yeah. She, she's a Georgia peach. And, uh, in fact, I, when she was sick, uh, very s close to where we toured with you guys, and I went down to, like, I was driving from Nashville to Tallahassee. And I would, at one point, the Atlanta route was a little quicker. Anyway, I went through Macon and picked up some Finch's barbecue and brought some for Jason. And he, like, because that's a very, it's a Macon staple. You're and, a very thoughtful person. You gave me a gift today. It's incredible. Thank yeah, you. I mean, yeah. of course, like, that's, that, sweet. that's, that's a love language, I guess, of mine. But um, yeah, that, it's a squash casserole, two kinds of like squash and zucchini, and then like little onions and some cheese on top and lots of cheese, of course. And a little egg in there, and just like it's the staple for Thanksgiving, Christmas. Every time I come down there, and of course I've never made it myself. I don't want to mess it up, but it's it's one of those things that I could have it at any time. I love that. Yeah. Oh yeah, my mom's food. Oh, I'll take it whenever. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you got the top down. You're on the PCH in California. You're looking mm -hmm. at the Pacific Ocean. Tops down. The, the, this song comes on the radio. It's one of your favorite songs, man. Fate, you're cranking it. Connecticut man. white bread. What's that? Connecticut white bread. <laughs> you know. That was Jim's band. Yeah. How'd you know? Yeah, um, you know, and it, it, this, this, you know, it's a, something that just keeps rearing its ugly head in your life. Man, because favorite song is a tough, tough question for any musician, sure. singer. Um, there's, it's a rotating thing. But let's see. Um, be, could be because of the drummer. It could be the lyrics. It could be the producer. It could be just the era of the song because it reminds you of something in your life. I, I will relate that that scenario that you eloquently put was uh my my best friend from high school his name is travis pasternak and he's has a great band now called because villains and he's actually he was the drummer in my band in in, in high school and now he started writing songs in college and so he's a lead singer and i've played drums for him now a, a, a few dozen times we've wow. done we've done little little shows in new york and stuff and like done little quasi tours kind of funny but we're still really great friends to this day but was in his wedding and everything anyway we would he would he's a year older so he got his license first in high school in inglewood florida in lemon bay high school yeah my Go parents live in port charlotte bro yeah. oh you know yeah so there's that that stretch of beach road between like minnesota key and inglewood beach and it goes to middle beach it's like all it's slightly north of port charlotte i think yeah, yeah. and so he had he got the car it was a freedom you know you're in high school and he, we would we jammed dave matthews band's crash record so Probably a song, a song from that record. We'll just go with the opening one. It's just so much to say that. So much to say, so much to say, so much to say, so much. Yeah, like, dude. Just that's probably because it it brings back that memory of that that you go back to that moment where that early just freedom. Two dudes like that yeah. musicians wanted to rule the world. You know, dude, I love it. Okay, and lastly, it's also very difficult. Favorite movie. Oh wow. I'll Decent. go something. You got to go with what's now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got like, you could go like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective or the, like all that stuff. But nice. I think re of the last more modern movies. Here's, here's a better way to phrase that question. Right. Cause it's like, you know, a movie you could sit down and watch anytime. No matter where guess, it is in the movie. Oh, man. And you're going to yeah. finish it. There's a lot it. of those. Yeah. There's a lot of that, like that syndicated movies like Independence Day. And listen, but I think <coughs> for me, uh, the second, the, the, Dark Knight, Batman's Dark, and the second iteration of the trilogy. Oh, of the with, Batman, uh, the, uh, with the Joker, the, uh, yeah. what's his name? Uh, Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger's Joker. Ooh, I saw that movie in the theater four times, and I don't see, like, yeah. I, that, you know, 
that's not something I do. Like that's the only movie I've seen in the, in the theater probably more than twice. Wow. And it just, to me, that's a perfect movie. The way that it was set up, being a Batman fan, you know, seeing the Michael Keaton ones and like the Tim, I'm a huge Tim Burton fan. We got a like, DC fan in the house, Jim. I mean, That's I, right. I, I think like I grew up with the Star, with Star Wars and, and like the superhero thing was, was pretty, was pretty big. So that, in fact, I might watch that soon. Like Dark Knight, just to me, it being the second in a trilogy, it was the darker, if you will, one. And it had those moments. And then of course the Heath Ledger character, I mean, it, it was Perfectly so, done. It, I mean, all right, rest in peace. I mean, like just. He should have won an Oscar. I, yeah. I mean, how yeah. it's, it's one of those things where you, you, it sucks that like that, that that's what did it. Like, cause it's just a method actor and like how dark that kind of can who, be. Who but. was the actress who played the, um, the female, uh, gosh, not Vicky. Vale. Was, there was, it was the actor. What was her in name? that one? Yeah. Uh, those, uh, oh, Kate, no, uh, Beckinsale, but, um, Boswell. No. Um, Gyllenhaal. There was Maggie. That's right. Maggie, That's Maggie, Maggie Hall. Gyllenhaal, Gyllenhaal yeah. was, was the love interest. Katie Holmes was the first in the first movie. Right. The second movie was Maggie but, Gyllenhaal. But Gyllenhaal was like when he went up to her, he grabbed her face and was so in character that she was actually getting so uncomfortable. She was looking off screen to the director for like, what's he doing? Dude. Like, you know, and they left it in the movie. Yeah, because it's Christ. genuine fear. It was it was genuine fear. Those like just, he probably didn't tell her he was going to do it. No. No, and like yeah, that's dude, great. Oh man, I, it's just his. It, and I think Christian Bale's great. The way it was all directed, the whole the plot, the whole thing, it was really, really well done. And so, yeah, yeah that's probably one of my favorites. That's great. Three, yeah. That's gonna that that is because uh, when it comes to Batman, the darker the better. Mm -hmm. Like you know, well, the entirety of of DC is dark. It's, it has a yeah, like yeah. the Marvel versus DC thing. The but Marvel, Marvel's more real. Marvel's more relatable. They, they gave you know? it like, for real as it can be for superhero movies. Like, yeah. They gave it this more like oh, you, this anecdotal, yeah. right? Like, yeah, you got all these you know near perfect characters with Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent. You know, Superman is he's got one weakness. You got Wonder Woman. You got it, it, there's too much perfection there in superheroes as we used to know them, and I think it's a cultural thing. But you know when oh, when RDJ embodied Tony Stark. What a flawed character. Yeah. You know, oh, and yeah. that was the most endearing part of it. Because he you know? the, there is obviously there's vulnerability there, spoiler yeah. alerts, but that's like, what I love yeah, about it. It's like that he can be defeated. Even and, the even the demigod, Thor, was was flawed. Had, yeah, had you know? had his yeah, had his weaknesses and right. it's it's kind of yeah, that's that's I've never thought about that too. Uh, the just the juxtaposition of the DC versus Marvel in that oh, yeah. light. That's really interesting because hey, I, think, I think that's why they've mm -hmm. been so popular as of Hey, the back past to Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, this is becoming she, capes and hammers now. Yeah, we, yeah. she's in crazy heart as the muse to jeff bridges it, oh, okay and crazy heart is it was like an indie it was very indie-ish but it was it was almost like jeff bridges was um like an old he plays the old school country star mm -hmm. that goes around and hires a band locally for all his gigs and he's just a drunk okay. and just lost in his life. I know I've heard the movie. And then seen Colin it. Farrell is the new kind of Garth Brooks slash Jason Aldean type. I am the new the guard. The hot new guy. Yeah, yeah, the hot new guy. Great film. Okay. Yeah. Down the list for sure. Yeah. Well, I think movies, like, again, I was a Star Wars fan. So the, the, the influence, the creative influence that we have as creatives yeah. comes from all, all things. Like, movies to me was one of those. I mean, again, seeing the Star Wars trilogy for the first time, like, now we're talking the 1976 film, right? Right. Yes. The paper mache and the you, matte the, the paintings small, and the small the... models that would yeah. like and the the, the camera. That, that, to me, that's what was so like Lucas and Spielberg finding ways to make this massive movie look amazing with like models and just camera tricks. They couldn't. Yeah. They didn't anticipate it being as big as it was. They couldn't have. I no. mean, and Lucas did say that he, the reason he made four, five, six before one, two, three is because he knew that the worlds and the galaxies and the, the planets that he had just, there was the, he knew maybe graphics CGI would get there, but it wasn't there. He had to do these with, with what yeah. he had and man, just like and John Williams. I mean, come on, like yeah. the emotion behind all those, the, 
I still like the melodies that he has, like when, when Vader is dying in Luke's arms and like the, 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 the melancholiness of it, like yeah, all man. that influences us as musicians, as creatives. Yeah. And so you, you kind of lose sight of that when we, we so laser focused on learning the song and everything. And then like, when you really take a moment to breathe, it's like, how are you influenced and what's you, what are you about? And you start to realize, Oh, that's other things. I love that. You love that. Cause uh, the latest alien film, alien Romulus is the best alien movie since 1978 it uses not the, even aliens it, it's no it this really? thing, it's so good it uses a guy in a suit it uses animatronics it uses prosthetics it uses matte paintings it uses cgi every technique we have to make horror and sci-fi films was used highly effectively tons of tip of the hats to the previous films to the, yeah, they, and yeah. it's scary as hell were you a Sam Raimi guy? Yeah, because it's it was this movie was directed by the guy that did the reboot of Evil Dead, which is Sam disgusting Raimi. and terrifying. Right, Isn't that Bruce Campbell. Yeah, yeah. And normally I'm not a horror Raimi guy, Park. but that but the suspense is different than horror. Like, so I think I've not seen. Yeah. Gosh, I can't. It's been almost forever since I've seen the, the original Aliens movies. Yeah. but I'm gonna check that one out too. Oh, that's for me. It's Alien, and then Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> oh yeah, like, that's one of those movies that comes on. You have to watch it. Yeah, I see all the clips. So, yeah. Andy Dufresne was like a bird; I couldn't be caged. He yes. crawled through his five, feathers were far too bright. Crawled through five hundred yards of of, of vile shit. Uh, I don't, I don't want to think of. No, no, this is good. we always get an R rating. Yeah, we always get an R rating. So uh, people can uh, keep in touch with you and follow you, buddy. It's McCoyGibbs dot com. You're on Facebook as Robert McCoy Gibbs. Instagram. At, at McCoy dot Gibbs mm -hmm. and you're you know one of the few drummers I know on the X trying to keep it alive you know I joined in 2009 McCoy Gibbs on X yeah I don't think I honestly haven't been on Twitter slash X in a while but yeah yeah I guess it's there I prefer the cute little bluebird I don't know why he had to screw it all up well that's yeah. that's another podcast I totally <laughs> Jim, I, I don't any, know if he screwed it up guys, any any so. closing statements Jim you have been extra quiet today but I mean when you I'm spoke allowing, it was like E.F. Hutton E.F. Hutton I'm not, is that a good thing? <laughs> Remember the ads when when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. It was oh. like a 1970s law firm. Well, it's about damn time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I just want to say I appreciate you having me, and this is one of those Are really cool experiences. I I think you're the Jim and I used to say, "What did you learn?" And like for me, this that was our is, signal to wrap it up. Yeah, this yeah. was just um, you know the idea that you came in a different way yeah. and achieved the same results. Yeah, and that, I think that's what I have. You know in a town where there's so many great players and has so many great personalities, drums, guitar, anything. Um, I've stopped trying to be anything else but myself, you know, and like, because I've did just came in a different way, like learned late bloomer, learned late, like just kind of found my way and just showed up prepared and listened to songs yeah. and played them. And like, are you going to, are you going to die with the sticks in your hand? Do you have other interests, other like hobbies or things? That's that, a great question. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of at that little, a little bit of that, you know, you know, crossroads, crossroads, if you will, of, of, of like, you know, I've got some, whatever it's the real estate thing or the, or playing. I, I mean, I, I would love to play till the wheels fall off. I mean, honestly, I think that's things staying in shape. Like, you know, yeah. so as long as Lauren has me, I'll be there. And if, and there's other opportunities that come up, I'd love to entertain those too. And like, but yeah, I think that I'd love, there's some things on that goal list that I'd like to, to, to achieve. And if, but like, you gotta, you know, gotta keep, just keep practicing, getting better. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, because of the, some of the things that have lined up well for me, timing wise, I have the 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 fortunate opportunity to to do this for the next fifteen twenty years at a high clip. And, yes. Uh, and what's the rest of the year look like for you guys? We've got um, a couple of weeks off here. I'm going to be in town and 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 woodshed a little bit downtown, which is awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing those fantastic players as well. Yeah. And playing with those guys and girls. And then uh, she's got I think maybe twenty dates here and there, a few festivals and fairs, um, a few Opry's. She's an Opry member, so we do that as well. And um, but just nothing shoot like our, our 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 watermark for the year was was the, you know, the tour with you guys yeah. was really fun and so um, yeah and then she'll take we'll do, we'll kind of wind down I'm sure we'll do some like the the Christmas tour the St Jude tours where we do the St Jude shows the radio oh. shows and stuff in December that's and that's great. always fun yeah and then have some holiday time off with the family and and oh uh, we're gonna be doing the, we're doing Halloween Thanksgiving and Christmas before we know it it's here. I already feel like the, the leaves are starting to change colors a little bit, Jim, here mm -hmm. in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. they're going to burst into flames. <laughs> I know it is 100 degrees today. Yeah. 
but yeah, so it's it'll be a good rest of the year and a nice little balance of, of in, in and out of town stuff. Well, mm-hmm. give her a hug for me and that entire band. Me too. And I'm so proud of you. And See, this is from Jim. And super happy poop. for you. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. will do that. I Jim, will do that. thank yeah. you for your time and talent as always, buddy. Well, thank you. Yeah. Really do it's appreciate it. Great to meet that. you today. Yeah. Meet you yeah. as well, buddy. Yeah. It seems that we we keep each other in each other's lives, man. We cannot escape each other. Yeah. I'm telling you. It's a great thing. Till the end. We're definitely due for another guys' night. We do. We almost had one tomorrow night with the uh, Hagar concert that I'm going to. I know. that's You're going to have yeah. so much fun. Uh, Lover Boy, because we had Matt Frenette on the show, and then Jason Bonham. So Jim has taken upon himself to go down there and represent and see the show. I got a 10 o'clock bus call. So. Of course yeah. you do. Of course I do. Yeah. Hey, folks, here's the book, Making It in Country Music, an insider's look at the industry. It took a year of my life, but really 50 years of my life to write the book. Pick that up. Jeff Bezos will lick the stamp, send the book right to your house so you can download it to your Kindle. And maybe I'll do a read here on Audible at some point. But you got to buy the book, folks. Buy the book. It's a, it's a, what do they call it? Hardcover. Yeah, it's a coffee table book. All right, and if you love the show, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review it. It helps people find the show. And we'll see you next time. We'll be here. Thanks, McCoy. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe. Rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.